Hi, everybody. Welcome to Adobe Live. I'm here with Nathaniel Dodson. My name is Michael Jarrett. We're happy to have you here for day two. We're going to be doing some awesome Photoshop compositing work. Um, just so you know, if you're joining us on behance.net slash live, if you participate in the chat in about 30 minutes, we're going to do an awesome giveaway. All you have to do is say, hey, so tell us where you're from, ask a question, say hi. Today we're giving away these posters. Ooh. Yeah, we got yeah, Mr. T, we go. some luggage tags, and a wonderful illustration. These were done on Adobe Live a while ago, so if you're participating in the chat, you have a chance to win all three of these posters in about 30 minutes. Uh, if you're joining us on YouTube, consider hopping on over to behance.net slash live and participate in that chat there so you get a chance to win some of these. Um, and a little bit of logistics. We're also doing a challenge today. This is day two, and today's challenge, if you're not familiar yet, is to create an infographic in Illustrator and Photoshop, or Photoshop. Um, We've got a bunch of really awesome templates on behance.net slash live. Go check out the challenge tab. Click on the link to download the templates, change some colors, create some fun facts, maybe choose real facts, um, and create a health-related infographic. Share it with us. There's a URL there. And in about one and a half hours, we'll be taking a look at those uh, live on stream, reviewing them, giving our thoughts, and ultimately picking our favorite to win a one-year subscription to Creative Cloud for free. And there were a lot of template selections. There are we're a lot. It out yeah, early. yeah. So go wild. That'll be really fun to look at. So good morning, Nathaniel. Yeah, man. Good How's morning. it going? Glad to be back. Yeah. Here we are, day two. Back again. Yeah. And I'll so, be back again tomorrow. That's right. This is day two of three. Uh, <clears> yesterday, <throat> we created a really amazing, gritty kind of poster, London calling, firefighter, carrying the double city. Exposure, of, double exposure, triple exposure, coloring effects, text effects. We it, covered a lot. We did. About masking. And then we did the chicken explosion at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Just as like yeah. an additional, if, additional. Uh, if you stick around, you might see us turn some fried chicken into rocket explosion. <laughs> That's right. And if you don't know what we're talking about, check out the replay of yesterday's yeah. stream. At the end, we went a little wild. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was good, though. Yeah. And it looked delicious. So take us what you're going to go yeah, through Yeah, so today. what we're going to do today, I've got an example here on my screen. We're going to create this sort of juice poster. Um, you know, it's just not not typically what you would think of when you think of compositing, at least myself. I think of uh, compositing portraits and moving somebody from one scene to another. We're going to cover more of that type of compositing a little bit tomorrow. But for today, it's about just mixing, sort of mixing media, if you will, um, and creating a composite that makes sense and also would be totally usable for something that you're doing, right? You, this could be um, a sub that you turn upright and you have slices of avocado slice, you know, <laughs> sliding into it. It could be slices of strawberry going into a strawberry juice. Um, you could do it with pretty much anything. Slice, slices of watermelon going into that. Um, or you could, you know, have slices of watermelon going into the side of a football helmet. You can really, the, the technique could really be used for right. any, any cylindrical, cylindrical or object. spherical object. Um, and you can, you can really do something like this with, with just about anything. Uh, you can even do it with, you know, a, a human body or an animal or something. Take a zebra and sort of unwind its stripes, so to speak. Um, and there's just a lot of things you can do. But this is a, a very sort of broken down, the, the finished result's a little complex, yes, but we're going to break it down pretty simple and it's gonna be a step-by-step -step thing. And the techniques are exactly what you would use for doing something like a Ford mentioned zebra or strawberry juice or you know whatever it might be. Um, so I guess we'll just jump in and, and uh, get the show on the road. Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. So what I'm gonna do, I am going to begin uh, as, we've, as we usually do with a new document here in Photoshop. Uh, what's better than just a nice fresh document? I'm gonna go with 1275 by 1650. It's a little bit of an arbitrary number that I just picked out. It's kind of more or less the aspect ratio I want. You could make it bigger, you could make it smaller, obviously, and for a true blue, like if you were pr uh, doing this for a, a print job, number one, you'd probably go CMYK, um, and you would probably also go a bit larger in terms of the actual pixel dimensions. But because this is a tutorial and an example for today, I'm gonna go with something that's just nice and fast and kind of easy for my, uh, my meager little computer to handle. <laughs> Now here we've got our background locked up. We're going to go ahead and set a foreground color. In fact, maybe I'll, I'll make this a little bit bigger just so it's a little easier to see our foreground background color. I'm going to uh, click here on the black and I'm going to go ahead and fill, uh, fill this with the color F6. Uh, let's go BD62. So we're going to go with like a pretty light orangey color and then I can hit option delete. That's all backspace on the PC and boom, we fill the background just like that. I'm going to go ahead and create a new layer. And what we want to do, if we just quickly reference our, uh, our initial image, we have this sort of glow happening behind the orange juice. 
I'm gonna create this manually. I'm not gonna use a gradient because I wanna have sort of multi layers of glow that I can free transform and move and push and pull and, and kind of gussy around a little bit. I'm gonna grab my elliptical marquee tool here and I'm just gonna drag out a selection. It can be whatever. I just kind of want it to be a keyhole, boom, right there in the middle of my document. And I'm gonna select my foreground color. And this time I'm gonna fill this with something a little lighter. So I'm gonna go FE uh, E6 D3, which is you know still kind of in the same vein, orangey looking, uh, but a bit lighter. Option delete, alt backspace again to fill that. And we'll go select and choose deselect to just uh, kind of make the selection go away. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go select and select all to just kind of ring my entire document with a selection. And if I grab my move tool, we have now alignment options up here. So I'm gonna align vertically and horizontally like that and then command or control D uh, to deselect. All right, now that we've done that, I'm probably gonna duplicate this layer before I begin blurring. So I'm gonna hit command or control J and then here's a quick, very helpful hotkey. Uh, if, you, if you enjoy hotkeys in Photoshop, command or control and the comma key will hide the selected layer. It's such a fast and easy way. You can select multiple layers and quickly hide them. Uh, that way you don't have to kind of drag your mouse down and keep the straight line and all that. Just select them all, command or control comma, boom, they're gone. All right, layer one, I'm gonna go filter. I'm gonna go blur. I'm gonna go Gaussian blur. And I wanna go, not 44, I probably wanna go more like 200, something like that. That looks pretty good. I'm gonna hit okay. We've got a glow happening. I'm gonna turn on the solid layer above this. And for this, I don't want it to just be the same exact blur. So I'm gonna hit Command or Control T, by the way. That is the same as going Edit and Choosing Free Transform. And I'm going to drag the sides in a little bit. And I intentionally, I kinda of don't want this to be exactly uniform. Maybe if it's a little cockeyed and off the one side a little bit, that's totally fine. It's gonna add just, it's not gonna be very noticeable, but subliminally it, it will add sort of this organic element, organic feel to overall what we want to feel very fresh, organic, right? Fresh squeezed orange, orange juice. juice yeah. Right. You want, it to, you want to feel juice. clean, right? <laughs> exactly. And then we can just go filter and we can hit Gaussian blur right at the top of the menu. That's going to give us that same 200 pixel Gaussian blur. And you can see it's just going to off center our glow just a little bit. It doesn't do a lot, but it does just enough. And I'm going to name these both glow just in case we uh, lose our ability to see the thumbnail for some bizarre reason. How often uh, do you name your layers? I All the time. All the time. All the time. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm a little obsessive compulsive when it comes to the, uh, right. the, the naming of layers. All right. I'm going to open up my libraries panel here. And what I want to do is drag in this Adobe stock image of the glass of orange juice. And I'm going to place it right there in the middle. When you drag uh, an Adobe stock photo into an open Photoshop document, it's going to automatically either size it to the width or height of the document, depending on what the narrowest side is. So the image will always fit and you can see it, it, it in its entirety. So knowing that, I can just let it kind of snap into place there. And I'm going to go with this new artificial intelligence feature in Photoshop. It's one of my favorite features of Photoshop that they've introduced in a long time, like a feature that just, I find myself using it all the time. And it's this guy right up here, select subject. You gotta grab a selection tool in order to get it. In fact, maybe you gotta grab quick select in order to get it. Uh, or you can just go select and choose subject. The idea is Photoshop will analyze the layer that you've got selected and pick out the selection. And you can see with an image like this where we have such a clear cut yeah. distinction between the white background and the orange juice. I mean, come on, it does a really great job. Now it misses a couple little, a couple little tidbits of splatter up there, but I don't really care about that stuff. I think this is good enough. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go select and we're gonna choose select and mask. We love it, we hate it, uh, but we still use it. So if I zoom in on this, I'm gonna be able to see this selection's pretty good. Now remember, this is just a, this is not refined at all. This one is just click. the clean one click selection, exactly. And, and it's done this much. Now, granted, it is over a solid white background, but I challenge you to name me a faster way to select that. Magic Wand won't do that. Uh, quick Selection won't even do that. Select Subject does it. Uh, so one of the things that I'm, that I'm thinking about in my head as I look at this, the screws are turning in my head, um, there's a lot of orange in the background. And a couple things you need to keep in mind when you're working on composites are direction of light, the perspective of the image that you're moving into another scene or the perspective of the scene into which you're moving an image. Or in this case, we also want to consider ambient light. So in this scene that we've built, the ambient light is not going to be very white like it is on the edges of these glasses. See all the, the edges are very white and glowing almost. 
it's going to be it, that, that reflected light. Light, when it reflects off of an object, be, becomes colored by that object, right? If I hold up a, a whiteboard and blast a flash off of it into your face, you're going to have clean white light. But if I change that to like a sheet of blue paper, the light that's filling in the shadow side of your face, let's say, is now going to have a blue tinge to it. So we need to give this sort of orangey tinge to this highlight. This is not something I'm going to do in Select a Mask. It's just the, the data and information gathering stage of my mind kind of working and, and moving along here as we, as we check this out. Uh, so I'm going to hold down Spacebar, and it's going to temporarily give me my hand tool. I can see I've got a little glowing action down there. I can also, by the way, see that they didn't quite have a, a totally clean environment in which they were shooting this glass. You can see the reflection of yeah. whatever was going on in the studio there. But don't worry. We're going to clean that all up, and you'll see. It's going to look perfect uh, in no time flat. What I want to do, I want to mess around with the global refinements here. Um, I don't really think I need or want to use the refine edge brush. I think it'll do a lot more damage than good for us here. So I think global refinements will work. We're going to smooth out our selection a little bit, maybe 10, 15. I don't want to smooth it out too much. I like the little droplets of water that we're getting over here. Those are nice. It uh, gives a nice texture to the outside of our glass. And up here, you know, everything is pretty smooth. Now, one of the things you notice is like right here around this droplet, you can see all that haloing where we're getting that fringing from the background. That's obviously going to be a problem uh, if you're concerned at all about having a selection that looks convincing. So one a, a cool trick uh, that you can do here in Select a Mask for cleaning up straight edges is to increase feathering uh, a bit, maybe like three, four pixels, maybe even more. And then just drag that contrast slider up and keep dragging it up until you see the majority of those white bits going away. So you can see here, if I bring this back up, there's still a little bit. There's a little bit we need to clean up, right? But pretty much around the rest of our edges, we have a nice, very, very clean edge. A couple little areas, right? We gotta clean stuff up, but not bad. So what I think I'm gonna do, I'm gonna zoom in on those areas, and we can do that right here in Select and Mask. I'm gonna grab my, uh, I gotta turn my Wacom on. I always forget to do this. I use it in wireless mode, and it has a, an auto power off mode after, I don't know, a few minutes. And I always forget to turn it on. Here we go, I'm gonna grab the brush. I'm gonna use my square bracket keys. I'm gonna make the brush a little smaller, and then I'm just gonna begin painting. But you can see what happens here when I do this. I'm actually adding, so I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna switch the brush here, and I'm gonna set it to the subtract mode up here. And then I would just come in here and say, yeah, get rid of that little bit of white. Maybe just a tinge of haloing there, a little bit of white there. And again, this might be more than you ever really feel like you need to do. And a lot of times with composites, it's not about making the composite selection pixel perfect. It's about making sure it looks good over the background you're using. That's part of the reason why, and I should have mentioned this earlier, here in Selected Mask, the view mode I'm generally going to use is either an onion skin. Now the onion skin you can set to any level of transparency. This can be more helpful when you have a background that's not like a solid color and you're not compositing it over another nearly solid color. So in this case, onion skin is whatever. I would usually go to on layers because what that's gonna do is it's gonna show you the object you've cut out over the current layers. That way you can actually factually see what that edge is gonna look like. Sometimes it's useful to have the black and white version of it if you're really trying to check out, let's say, hair and make sure you don't have a bunch of glowing coming off the side. Um, but in this case, on layers is what I'm gonna use and it's what I use, quite frankly, most of the time. All right, I'm gonna zoom back in. I'm just gonna try to clean up a couple of these little spots that are bugging me. I'm gonna grab that brush tool again. I already have it set to that minus mode. I'm just gonna wipe out a couple of these areas. I could even come in and just knock that out a little bit. I don't think anybody will, will see that's missing. And if they do, you can tell them to go pick on somebody else's artwork because we don't, we don't have the time. And there so you're a total fan of using the uh, Wacom get more gestural, natural movement to kind of... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know, yes, it, using the Wacom has changed the way... When I got the Wacom, it changed the way that I edited my photos and worked in terms of graphic design. Yeah. It was the biggest thing. It, it just changed the way I worked. Um, now, that being said, I know some really good photographers that do really good work who have pretty much never used uh, the Wacom tablet or or any tablet for that matter. So Forget mouse, being brand loyal. Trackpad even. Yeah, exactly. And 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 I'm talking like incredible high end commercial photography, photographing celebrities. Uh, for the longest time, Jeremy Cowart never used a Wacom. He only just got started, I think, a couple years ago, using a Wacom tablet. Um, all right, so this is close enough uh, for what I'm looking for. And what I'm going to do here, this is kind of important. We're going to choose to output this to a layer mask. So this is simply going to add this layer mask that we've created, which is going to make all that white disappear. It's going to add that to our layer. So there we go. We've got a layer with a layer mask. White background is gone. 
All right. Do we have any questions here, Michael? We have one question, <coughs> which I know uh, you answered yesterday, which is your preferred size of uh, document that you like to work in. I mean, it all depends on what I'm doing. Obviously. But for the most part, I, I almost like with something like this, if it wasn't a tall, skinny glass of juice, I almost all, like my go to is 2560 by 1440. And it's just honestly, it's just because it's that 2K video frame size. There's not really any other reason. It's just numbers that jump into my head. It's bigger than 1920 by 1080, um, but it's not like a full 4K frame you're working with. Um, and it's that 16, that 169 ratio. Uh, so it, I don't know, it just works. So I, it, it's kind of my go-to when I'm just messing around with something. If I'm opening and I just want to play with, you know, drawing some letters or something, that's pretty much always what I go to. And I'm more of a, even with photography, I'm, I'm almost always a landscape orientation rather than portrait orientation. I always feel like, why go with portrait when you can just make it wider? I don't know, my mind works side to side, not up to down, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. And I have no idea what that means. But when I'm using the camera, even when I'm doing headshot portraits, you know, a lot of people say, you gotta go portrait. I just, like, I can, but I never feel like the photo's right. right. I never feel like it's right. And I have a battery group, so it's not like I'm, I'm reaching around to grab my camera <laughs> some weird, funky way. It's just, I don't know, just one of those weird personal preferences. All right, so a minute ago, we were talking about the edge, the edges and the highlights here of this juice. We need to change the colors of those, and we want to change the colors of them rapidly and uh, effectively. I'm just moving the, the glass over a little bit. We're going to attempt to do that using the, um, the selective color. See, Michael, I mentioned this the other day with the resting spot for the eyes. See, that's annoying. Every time I open it, I end up doing that. <laughs> it's probably automatic now that you just always oh, yeah, pull up that layers panel. We all have our crosses to bear. That's right. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clip this selective color layer to the orange juice. Command Option G. That would be Control Alt G for those of us on the Windows machine. And here in the selective color dialog box, I'm just going to target the whites. So this is just the absolute brightest bits of the image and specifically of the orange juice because we've clipped our selective color layer to only attack our orange juice. And here I'm going to say, look, um, hey, highlights, we want to take some cyan out of you. And the reason I say that is cyan, magenta, yellow are the opposite of RGB, right? So you can think cyan, magenta, yellow, uh, red, green, blue. So cyan and red are opposites. Magenta and green are opposites. Yellow and blue are opposites. So if I remove cyan, I'm going to add red. The reason I want to add red is because, well, I want to make these pretty white highlights more reddish orange colored. It's the color of the orange juice, right? So I'm going to go like, I don't know, I'm going to go like negative 50 maybe. And we can see it doesn't do a whole lot, but we're setting the stage. We're setting the base here. I want to remove some magenta that's going to infuse a little bit of green. Again, that green, orange, tropical -y color. And then I'm going to push some yellow into there. Now you can see as I push yellow in, if I, well, if I push too much, it's kind of ridiculous. But that really gives you an idea of exactly the part of the image that this is targeting, right? And it's just so happens to be exactly what we need to be targeted. So I'm going to take this yellow, and I'm only going to push it up, I don't know, plus 25 or so. And we can see there's before and there's after. So it's a very subtle change, but I think it's a change that's important. And as I look at it, I think there's still too much highlight happening over here. So we would come over here, and because we had added a layer mask, we can simply work on this layer mask. And I can take, where's my brush tool here? There it is. I'm going to make my brush quite a bit smaller. I'm going to go ahead and make sure the opacity of the brush tool is set to 100%. And, well, I don't want to paint with white. I want to paint with black because I want to make this go away. And I'm going to click once. In fact, I probably don't even need to use my tablet here. I'm going to click once. I'm going to hold down Shift, and I'm going to click right there, and it's going to make a straight line with the brush tool. I'm going to try bringing it back, holding down Shift, and just, you know, one pass at a time until we just get rid of as much of that white as we want to be gone. And I think what I'll also do is just get rid of some of it up here around this part of the orange juice as well. Something kind of, sort of, like that. And it's a little bit too soft, so I'll probably right click, boost the hardness of the brush, and then go back over it painting with white, just to kind of solidify the edge a little bit, if you will, just like that. And if I just back it out, you can see it just helps that edge blend so much more. I don't want to have a nice finished composite and have this one edge where there's very obviously, you know, one part of it that you're like, why? Right. Why didn't you just... And as we discussed yesterday, when you had that gut feeling in the moment, like, man, I should, right. I should exactly. take care of that. It's always better to do it if when it's you're working worth, on the layer. If it's worth doing it yeah. all, it's worth doing right. Yeah. I don't know. Some smart person said that. I don't know who it was. But <laughs> Nathaniel Dodson. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can't take credit for it. I can't take credit for it. All right. Now, here's a pretty cool trick. So we want to mask both, or not mask, we want to merge both of these layers together, but independent of the background. Now, yesterday we covered the whole select all my layers and merge them to a new layer hotkey. That's Command Shift Option and the letter E or Command or Control Shift Alt E for the PC. You can actually just merge individual layers together by selecting them and merge them to a new layer. So you select them and you hit Command Option or Control Alt and the letter E and it'll take both of those layers, package them together and boop, pop them up onto their own layer. 
Now that we've done that, we're just going to hide our original orange juice. This is just, in fact, I'll select the layers, I'll group them up. This is just kind of like a master, I'll call it even Master OJ. OJ the juice, not the person. And so we just have it kind of hanging out there. I can even shut it off just to let me know it's gone, it's hidden in the background. If something catastrophic happens and I need to revert back and I only have 50 history states or something, I still have my isolated glass of orange juice hanging out doing its thing. Now I'm gonna name this layer orange juice. There we go, we're good to go. And I think it's time to add some water or orange juice to the foreground. So I'm gonna open up my, my libraries once again, and I'm gonna drag in this blue water splash, and you're gonna see it's gonna make it as wide as my document is again. I want the splash to be a bit bigger, so I'm gonna hold down Shift and Alt, let me shift an option on the Mac, and oh, I don't know, I'll probably pull it up like about that big. I want it to be reasonably sized, and I'll hit Enter or Return to commit that. I'm going to collapse my libraries, collapse my adjustments, so we can see what's going on here. I'm going to call this OJ Splash. There we go. And now what I want to do is get rid of all the, the white. Part of the difficulty when you're compositing stuff like water, like uh, maybe you have a model who's sort of pulling a dress, her dress up. Uh, she's got like a big ballet dress or something, and it's, it's semi-opaque. You're going to have that background carry through whether it's a solid white background or, you know, Valley Forge National Park behind her. You're gonna have that stuff coming through the dress. So usually blend modes are our best friend when it comes to getting rid of stuff like that and preserving, uh, preserving the very fine detail that we want. So I'm gonna go try setting this to multiply and you can see we've just dropped away all the white. We preserve all the shadow and highlight detail in the water. And I mean, can it be easier? It's one click. That's yeah. even easier than the select uh, select <laughs> subject option. You just uh, get rid of everything in one fell swoop. All right, what we want to do is we want to convert this to black and white to get rid of the blue, and then we'll recolor it. So I'm going to open up adjustments once more, and I'm going to collapse the panel as per usual. Once more. I'm going to add the black and white adjustment layer, and you can see it's attacking everything. We're going to use that same clipping mask trick, Command Option or Control Alt and the letter G. And I'm going to choose from the presets. I'm going to go with the green filter. It's just going to add a little bit more contrast to like those shadowy tones in our water. And you can see it just it just brings out kind of the darker details of the water uh, a little bit more. And now that we've done that, I want to apply a levels adjustment layer also above this. So I'm going to go levels. I am also going to clip this to the stack, command option or control alt G. And with this, I don't know. I think we should, I think we'll add a little bit more in terms of the blackness. We'll pull our black input point up to about 35. Um, and then we're going to shift our midpoints, open up the highlights, maybe about like that. And now that I've added some contrast, I think I actually want to tone the contrast back a little bit. Uh, let's boost our black output, uh, I don't know, to like 70, something like that. We'll really see what it looks like when we add color. Because it's an adjustment layer, we can always come back later and mess around with it. But I'm really killing off the contrast. I made the shadows a little heavier, and then I faded it across the board. We'll see what happens here. Uh, what I want to do now is begin coloring. And I'm going to use the color balance adjustment layer, just like that. Command option or control alt G once again. By the way, if if you don't like hotkeys, first of all, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't like hotkeys? <laughs> Second of all, there is a way to do this. You can hold down your alt or option key and just hover between the layers and you get this little funky little widget uh, icon that basically says, hey, this layer into that layer. And you can click that and you get a clipping mask. But it, it's a lot faster to just be able to boom. Command option or control alt G. All right, so here uh, with our uh, with our uh, color balance, I want to go ahead and I want to add a bunch of red. Now remember, we want to keep our eyes, maybe I should even zoom in just on the water uh, behind us because that's that's what we're working on here. So we're going to go about plus, plus 50 on the red. I'm not going to mess with the green in this case, and I want to get rid of blue. Remember, we had a lot of blue initially in the water, and blue is kind of what you associate with water. Blue is not necessarily what you associate with orange juice. Uh, if it is, I would humbly submit that you haven't had very good orange juice. Yeah, you uh, need to over. throw it out probably and buy <laughs> exactly. it fresh. fresh exactly. So we're going to go like negative 30. Just push. Remember, we're just working in the midtones, and we're going to play with highlights and shadows. But we're just pushing a, a nice just uh, of yellow into those midtones. If I shut off color balance, you can see we're making a bit of a change, but we still need to make more of a change. So I'm going to go highlights now. And for highlights, I'm also going to throw some red into the highlights. About plus 25, I think, will work well. And then I'll throw a little bit more yellow into the highlights, right around negative 10-ish. You know, none of this is ex an exact science. I just kind of know where I'm going with the colors um, in my head. And then here for the shadows, I think this is where we're going to see the biggest color swing. I'm going to go ahead and try to push, I don't know, enough red into them. Let's go like plus 50. I think that'll work. Uh, once again, I'm not going to touch magenta or green, and I'm going to push some yellow into these as well. And I'm just going to go with the yellow until I get something that looks like a, a nice 
kind of thick orange. Now, those of you who may uh, who are watching carefully may have um, noticed that this liquid is not necessarily the color of the orange juice liquid up above. You're right, and I'm, I don't mind that because we're gonna do two things that are gonna play tricks with your eyes. Number one, the, a trick is kind of being played on your eyes right now because, Michael, as you can see, you can see the base of the glass through that water. So you immediately assume it's a clear, light liquid. Mm -hmm. Orange juice is not a clear, light liquid. So if we make the bottom of the glass disappear, your, your mind is gonna automatically assume that it's a solid liquid, something that is no longer opaque that we're looking at. So we can kind of toy with your head that way. But also, I kind of want there to still be a little bit of that see-through-ness about this because I wanna convey the idea of refreshing, crisp, light, it's a sweltering hot day and you want to drink kind of thing. So what we'll do here is I think I'm going to mask the bottom of the glass and we're going to see what this looks like and, um, and kind of take it from there. So I'm going to go select my new orange juice layer and I will add a layer mask. And I'm going to go ahead and grab my brush tool. I'm going to hit the letter X to flip foreground and background. We want to be using the color black. Then I'm going to right click and I will boost the size quite a bit. I want this to be pretty big. I made about 130-ish, and then harden this down around 30%. And then we'll just come right through here, and I basically just want to kind of allow the glass to follow, sort of pick out one of the waves, if you will. And you can see we kind of have this wave right through there. We have a little bit of glowing at the base of the glass. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll zoom in on that. I'm gonna hit, uh, hold my space bar down and, and just navigate over. And I would make my brush tool smaller using my left square bracket, hit the letter X to paint with white, and I would just paint the glass in so it kind of follows this edge of the water. That's, that's where the water begins to be totally opaque. You can no longer see through it and uh, you shouldn't expect to see through it. I'm gonna get rid of that edge of the, edge of the base of the glass just because it's dark and distracting. So you can see immediately how much of a difference that makes. We now assume, even though I just told you I was gonna play this trick on you, we automatically assume that the liquid in front of this glass is solid. Right. And it looks totally convincing, right? I mean, at least I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's where things are gonna get a little complicated. So I think before we jump into this sort of path creation, do we have any questions, any interesting feedback in the chat, Michael? We do, can... so Joshua Nell Nellis uh, okay. is asking, is there a way to fix the reflection in the bottom of the glass or is it one of those things that you need to work with? I kind of feel like maybe we just addressed it in Yeah, this so case. in this case, I get rid of it. If you can't get rid of it, what I would do is there's a lot of similarly colored stuff around here. So if I just add another layer above this and grab like my healing brush, I would set my healing brush to current and below. That's because we're working up on a new layer and just sampling from the layer beneath. And I would probably say, all right, we're gonna continue the shadow down. And then I would just begin moving across the glass kind of like this and you know get rid of it. And it's just a matter of you know taking the time. You really wanna like right here is where kind of the highlight begins. So you wanna sort of paint off of that and you would, you know, you would just spend the time that it takes to go across, across, across and clean up the glass until it looks perfect and smooth and good and, and you can get rid of it that way. Uh, another way that you could get rid of it is, again, if you do something like a, a black and white adjustment layer, you clip it to the orange juice, you fill the mask with black, I hit Command or Control I there to just invert the mask, and then here I would use my regular brush tool, I would paint with white, and I would just look to neutralize the color at the very least. Right, because then it's going to be much less distracting. Mm -hmm. It can just be sort of like, oh, there's this, you know, bar of silver back there, and in most scenes, it's not going to look out of place. Now that being said, if you're placing this glass on like a bright red counter or something, you may want to go in there with hue saturation and say, hey, swing this green to a red, boost the saturation a little bit, and be done with it. So a lot of different ways you can go there. For the for the purposes of our composite, we're just masking the whole thing away. But again knowing that the issue's there, and then having an idea of how exactly, by the way, I shift click the mask to make it appear and disappear, enable, disable it, um, but having an idea of what's there and then how you're gonna attack it, I mean, that's 90% that's of the battle in Photoshop, because anybody can, you know, you can Google for a tutorial, but knowing what to Google for is, is helpful. Right. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? We do have one other pretty interesting question. I do want okay. to remind everybody that in about in less than a minute, we're going to be doing our giveaway. So if you haven't participated in the chat yet, um, keep asking us some hard questions. This guy is a Photoshop wizard, so this is a really good chance to pick his brain for some knowledge. And you might win one of these. Very cool posters. All of these three have. posters, which were created on Adobe Live a little while ago by three very talented artists. And you should have heard Michael before the stream, he kept holding this one up and screaming, I pity the fool that won't submit something to yeah, try to get, it was I don't a, know what he was referring to. It was to, a whole thing, was, yeah. 
<laughs> Ridiculous. So we're gonna do that. Yeah, let's generate some giveaway hype. I think we're gonna just randomly generate a name here in the next couple seconds. It should appear magically in front of us. In three, two. Somebody said, how can I have the banana icon? We talked about that yesterday, um, but basically it's your edit toolbar button. You can click and hold to edit the toolbar and you can see it's gone. So now I'll go back to edit toolbar and all you do is hold down the shift key when you hit done and you'll have the banana. It has a little pop of color to another, uh, an otherwise gray, neutral uh, Adobe Photoshop user interface. And conveniently fits the color theme of this yeah, image exactly. that we're working with. It's that's, a, a, that's a good point, of a Mike. Breakfast. I'm glad you pointed that out. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without you. Yeah. <laughs> so we had another question while we're waiting for this name to pop up. Um, yep. Kind of an interesting one, uh, actually. Let's see if I can find it. Some people might want to know why these decisions are being made. And I'm sure this is a... I mean, it all depends on the decision that you're, you're, uh, you're asking about. A lot of it, a lot of, the, a lot of the stuff, it's kind of like driving a car. Do you pick exactly where you're sitting in the lane or is it just, just kind of happen, right? The longer you drive, the more you kind of, all right, I, I have a trailer on my car, so I'm gonna kind of drift to the left to make a wider right-hand turn. Um, when, you're, when you're picking up and eating a sandwich, how do you decide which side of the sandwich do you bite out of first, right? It's just, it kind of happens. And I'm, I'm using those examples because a lot of it is a matter of just using Photoshop. If you use Photoshop 15 minutes a day, from today until six months from now, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you're gonna run into um, a plethora of situations where you're just gonna realize you made a decision and never really thought about it. So a lot of it is, I don't wanna call it muscle memory, but I guess it kind of is, where you sort of, this happens, so I'm reaching for this tool. That happens, so I'm reaching for that tool. A lot of it is also like hotkeys, where you can't learn it all in a day. You can just pick up bits and pieces um, and it's better to try to it's better to try to learn something for 15 minutes a day in Photoshop than force yourself to sit down for like three hours one day a week. You'll learn so much more. You'll stick with it for so much longer, and you'll look back in six months and be like, "Whoa, I uh, I was terrible six months ago, and I feel like I know my way around now." And that's a, that's a pretty good feeling. And then you know, I mean, I've been using Photoshop since I was like nine years old. I first picked up Adobe Photoshop four, and uh, let me tell you, the I still remember the first thing I drew w with the paintbrush tool. It was a soft edge brush, probably about 20 pixels in diameter. was a green Gatorade lightning bolt, but it was just a green soft brush outline of roughly the Gatorade lightning bolt. And it looked like garbage. I don't even think I created a new layer. Um, I had no idea that I couldn't right just display. Back, right, I didn't know that I, could, I couldn't display like the PSD online. I didn't even know that I would share it online. Um, and I'm glad you did because Gatorade took that and it became yeah, their logo. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, I designed the Gatorade logo. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of it's just the more you use the application, the more those decisions, you don't think about them. Like the fact that you, the fact that you're still thinking about them, what that should tell you is you have a lot, you got, there's a lot of that road ahead of you to cover. But that's an exciting thing, you know, and, and there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff still in front of you that you're going to discover here in the next, you know, few months in Photoshop. Um, and that, that allow you know, that allows me to look at something like this and say, okay, this needs to be done. That needs to be done. Um, and sometimes too, uh, Michael, looking at other people's artwork and saying, oh, I bet you they, they did this or they did that, or they did, you know, some other thing in terms of how they created this piece of artwork. And, and that's, that's all very helpful yeah. as well. I mean, I think it helps to, to have sort of an idea. I mean, in, in the case of where we're at today, um, we have an idea of where we want the final image to be. Right, and so exactly. some of the decision making, why you need to do it is like, well, we can't have blue water in this orange exactly. toned image. Yeah. So there's a set of procedures needed. In fact, to I, can, I can show you guys. Um, I had, when I was coming up with the idea for this, I had a mood board of images that I gathered. This is just all stuff from Pinterest. Mm. And this was the stuff that I looked at. And I was like, okay, I want to do something similar to one of these. The initial concept of my mind was split open a piece of fruit and make something come out of it, right? And you know, you've got like this ice cream up here. That's a pretty cool idea. And you're gonna see, using the techniques in this tutorial, by the end of this, you'll be able to do this, right? 
uh, or splitting a strawberry and having juice coming out of it, right? That's kind of cool. Uh, and then here, this is kind of the, the concept that I settle on, hence the reason that it's the biggest one in the middle. We've got a glowing background. We've got liquid that the glass is coming out of. Now, you can now look at this and say, they really didn't do an amazing job masking out the glass down there. It almost looks like it's hovering over the water. Now, maybe the artist could argue that's what I wanted. Maybe they did. I don't know. But we're trying to mask it a little bit closer to the water. But we'll have slices of fruit coming out of our glass um, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But, you know, and I even threw in this, like, little uh, ketchup bottle down here because, again, it's, it's roughly a similar concept. And I do this stuff all the time. And I can show you for yesterday's, uh, for yesterday's tutorial, uh, it was all about double and triple exposure type stuff. So I just started pulling together some of that stuff. Now, some of you who've seen my videos, this is one from one of my tutorials. Uh, but there's just a bunch of other stuff. I don't know. There's just really sort of, I think they're called anaglyphs. Whoops. Mm -hmm. wrong, uh, wrong button. Red inside. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's just a really cool feature. Uh, really, you know, you can honestly, you can create something like that with multiple images and just using layer styles, you can do that in a couple minutes. Uh, but again, this is just to, to push my mind in a certain direction. I'm not trying to copy any one of these things exactly. It's just a good base point. And it's like trying to sketch something. If you, if you pull up an image of a good friend of yours and you, you want to sketch them, you're not going to sketch a photorealistic portrait of that friend. You're going to get something that's kind of an approximation of the friend and, um, you know, if you're a good if you're a good sketch artist, they're going to kind of know who it is, uh, but it won't at all look like the photo, and it's something that's totally uniquely your own. Yep, impressionistic. So, yeah, we have so a winner we're, we're for good? the posters. Okay, this is quite a name. All right, are we ready? Drum roll, please. I as know there's as, been as drum rolls for like it. five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the winner for today's posters for our random giveaway is Massimiliano Bonavia. That sounds like a good strong Italian that name. That is a strong name. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Congratulations, you're our winner. <laughs> Three posters are coming at you very soon. Oh, they get all three of them? All three, Oh, yeah. shoot. Wow, that's awesome. Okay. I thought it was one at a time, but that's, that's even better. That's all Triple of Triple dipping. Yeah. So everybody congratulate. Uh, Massimiliano. Massimiliano. Did I, did I get it right from memory? I think, I think so, yeah. <laughs> cool. cool. All right. Are we ready to jump back into I this composite? I think we're, we're going to jump back into it. Uh, just one quick reminder. We've got about 50 minutes, five zero minutes left for today's challenge. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about on be.net slash live, um, go to the challenge tab. There's a bunch of templates for infographics that you can use in Illustrator and Photoshop. We'd like you to download one of those and create your own health-related infographic. Mm -hmm. Take that as far and wide as you will. Change some colors, go crazy, be creative. We're gonna be reviewing them um, live on the stream in a little less than an hour. And the winner, our favorite, um, is gonna get a one-year subscription to Creative Cloud for free. So please do that if you'd like to challenge yourself and send us some challenging questions while we're working. I think we're gonna get right back into yeah. this really healthy, delicious <laughs> looking right. composite there image. There kind of is that tie-in with the health infographic. Right. How often do you drink orange juice versus cranberry versus apple? Mm -hmm. Orange juice a day <laughs> keeps the doctor away. Yeah, exactly. All right, so like I said before our, our little uh, break there, things are gonna get a little more complex here, but um, I think a, a lot, a lot cool. Um, there's, a, there's a really, really interesting selection technique that we're going to cover um, to get a very precise yet somewhat complex while still in perspective selection, if that makes any sense at all. Just follow me. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to do, uh, the, the goal is we need to begin making slices in our glass, right? We need to take pieces of the orange juice glass and make them go away. So we need to get very precise selections, but we need to be able to save those selections so we can get pieces of orange that exactly fit into those slots because the orange has to look like it's, it's coming out of the glass, right? So what we're gonna do, and the way I like to do this, is to grab the ellipse tool right here. It's underneath, you probably see a rectangle tool. It's underneath the rectangle tool. And we're going to make sure that we're drawing just a path. No shape, no pixels, just a path. And what I wanna do is this is kind of where it's up to you. Do you want to draw out a circle that's very big? I would say not. We want to keep it kind of flat, right? Because we're, we're sort of looking across this, this glass of orange juice. And I'm going to try to make the, the path about as wide as that fluted part of the cup is, okay? I'm going to jump over here to my paths panel here. I'm going to collapse my properties panel because that's just distracting. And I'm going to double click on this work path. This is going to save the path. I'm going to name this four. This is going to be our lowest path. We're going to go four, three, two, one. We need four of these ellipses. So I'm going to zoom in on this. And what I need to do, I really want the ellipse to be about as wide as the cup. You can see we're overshooting a little bit. Overshooting, honestly, is better than undershooting. But for the sake of the argument, maybe you haven't gotten something even this close. No worries. 
You don't want to use your regular selection tool. You want to come down here and use the path selection tool. You may be seeing the direct selection tool. No, no, no. We want the black arrow path selection tool. And with that, you can drag a selection over your path just like that. And now you can edit your path just like any other graphic. We can go edit. We can go free transform path. And you can just say, look, hey, edge of the path, bump in a little bit. Hold down the space bar, move over to the other side. I think we're actually good on the other side. Yep, just bump that in just like that. Enter a return, and we have our path just like that. All right, so this is path number four. We've got to go path three, two, and one. We're going to do that by duplicating the path, by clicking and dragging and dropping it on the new path icon. I'm going to drag it above just so my stack of paths exactly visually replicates the stack of paths on my PSD. And I'm going to name this path three. And now with your path selection tool, the black arrow, drag a selection over this path. We're only selecting path number three. Hold down shift and we're going to nudge upward with the up arrow key for 70 pixels. So this does 10 pixels at a time. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you may be saying, oh no, what happened to path number four? Don't worry, it's still down there. See, there's four, here's three. But what we need to do is zoom in on three. We need to select it again and you can see this needs to be stretched out now. So command or control T, stretch this sucker out. Boom, on that side, let's move across. Command or control T, I'm, I probably didn't even have to commit the free transform. And there we go. We now have the basis for our first slice. We have two of these shapes in place. But we need a second slice. It takes two of these ellipses just to create one slice. You'll see exactly what I mean in a second. So I'm gonna drag number three down to the new path. I'm gonna drag it up above everything and I'm gonna name this one two. And once more, drag. We've got our path selection tool. It's the black arrow, ladies and gents. Hold down shift. I want to move this one up 100 pixels. So I'm going to go hold down shift and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There we go. And I'm going to zoom in and command or control T. And we're going to stretch it out to the edge of the glass. Move over to the other side of the glass. Stretch it across like so. And to return to commit the change. And then I'll take path number two. Drag it down to the new path button. Drag that path up. We're going to name this path number one. Now this one, we want we want both the slices to be the same exact thickness. So the hundred pixel gap that we just created, that's going to be that's going to be this gap, this slice of the glass left behind. So we want that to be about hundred pixels, and each slice itself will be about seventy. So this one is only going to go up if I select it. We're going to hold down shift and tap the up arrow key. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then uh, once again, I'm going to zoom in. We'll go ahead, Command or Control T. Stretch this bad boy out. Get over to the other side. Stretch it out the other way. Voila. Zoom out. All right, so now we have our paths. One and two and three and four. Now comes the, the period or the point at which we make the cuts. And we make the cuts by creating precise selections. So what I want to do here... This is measure twice, cut once. And yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Make sure you get it right before measure twice, you make cut the once. Cuts. And I grew up doing construction, so trust me. Measure twice, cut once. Uh, and you also only have half the risk of cutting a finger off in the table saw or something if you we, do that yeah, as we well. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So what I want to do here is uh, a couple things. I think I'm going to try bringing up all the paths. All right. So I just what I did was I just shift clicked across all of them like that. And I want to hit Command or Control R. That's going to open up my rulers. From the rulers, I can drag guides. So I want to drag a guide right down so it cuts exactly across the middle of that ellipse and right across the middle of that ellipse and right across the middle of that ellipse and last but not least, that ellipse. And I, of course, I mess it up. If you mess up a path, you can grab your move tool, your standard selection tool, and you can actually grab the ruler and move it just like that. Now, I think part of the reason it's, it's given me difficulty getting to the exact center, I think technically it is the exact center, but not sort of the visual center. It's because I have snapping turned on. So now if I do this, you can see that I can get it. I want it more like right there. Now, I do want snapping turned on. And in fact, we want to make sure we snap two guides. And you're going to see why in just a second. So we're going to turn snapping back on. What I now need to do is load my number four path as a selection. Command or control and click on that path thumbnail. Boom, we have a perfect, beautiful selection. Now we're going to grab the rectangular marquee tool, hold down shift. Shift is going to add to the selection, right? See that little plus showing up next to our, uh, our little icon there. And now this is where the snapping to guides is important. We can just add this big rectangle above that uh, circular selection. Now we have two more steps to complete the selection. We want to intersect this selection with the juice glass. So we want to hold down Command Option and Shift. That would be Control Shift Alt on the PC and click the thumbnail for the orange juice. That's going to trim off those two wayward wings and give us a perfect flute on the edge.
Now we need to cut sort of the bevel in the top of this selection because it's got that top straight edge. So we need to subtract path number three from the top of this selection. And we do that by holding down Command and Option, that will be Control and Alt, and clicking the thumbnail for path number three. And you can see, after all of those steps, we have a perfect banner shape selection out of the front of our glass. And more importantly, one that we can save, and second, also important point, one that is perfectly in perspective with the glass that's replicatable 100 pixels above it, right? Now we're gonna go through all this again here, so if you missed a hotkey here or there, we're gonna cover it all. But what we need to do now is cut this from the orange juice layer and pop it up to a new layer. So Command or Control J is copy to a new layer. Command Shift or Control Shift J cuts that piece out and pops it up onto its own layer. You can see it's on its own layer. And we can call this OJ slice or something like that. Uh, in fact, I'll probably say lower, just so we know that's the lower one, because we're gonna have a higher one in just a second. Let's do the higher one. Let's walk through that again. I'm gonna hit Command or Control and the semicolon key to turn my guides back on. I am going to go back to paths. Now I'm going to, step number one, Command or Control click the lower path. I got Michael with the visual representation. <laughs> this is all I can do, step one. Command or Control <laughs> click that lower path. Grab the rec rectangular marquee tool, hold down Shift, and add to the selection. We're snapping to our guides, just like that. We need to trim those wings off. So we are uh, going to intersect select with the orange juice glass itself by holding down Command, Shift, Option, or Control, Shift, Alt, and clicking on the thumbnail for the orange juice. Last but not least, we need to cut the flute, or the, the whatever it is, I don't even know if flute is the proper term, the rounded edge in the top of our cut, Command, Option, or Control, Alt, and click on that uppermost path, then I can shut my guides off. I can shut my rulers off. That's command apostrophe to shut the guides off. Command or control R to make those guides go away. And now we go back to our original orange juice layer and command shift or control shift J to cut OJ slice higher. In fact, I'll stack that on top just because. There we go. We've now cut two slices out of our glass of orange juice. All right. And the problem here, Michael, that I see is that we're working with a two-dimensional image. This isn't proper 3D. So anything that's going to look or behave like 3D, we have to fake it. We have to add depth where depth isn't, um, much in the way that we fake to the depth across the water when we hit the bottom of the glass. So we need to add some kind of surface. Let me show you here. Our goal is going to be to add a bit of surface to, I gotta turn my tablet back on here. Let's try this again. We need to add surface to, here we go. Basically, we want to add something to here, and we want to add something to here. It's perfect. You can see, even doing that, yeah. you can immediately see yeah. the three-dimensionality, right? And we haven't, we haven't done Jack Diddley squat in terms of adding anything that's got some visual beauty. So this is, this, is, this is what I'm thinking of, right? So I'm just gonna delete that layer because we wanna do something a little bit more realistic for that. But before we get to the fill, we wanna put our orange slices in place, make sure they work seamlessly and beautifully and uh, everything will be right with the world. So I'm gonna open up my libraries again. I have this orange. I'm gonna drag this orange in and I'm gonna make sure it's kinda centered in my document like so. Maybe I'll hit Command or Control T and I'll just size it down a touch. Honestly, that's just a beautiful looking image like that kind of water splashing up, even with the white background, I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's not what we're here for. So I'm gonna collapse my adjustments here. I'm on the orange layer. I'm once again gonna use select subject and it's gonna work, I mean, darn near flawlessly for an image like this. Um, and as I say that, it doesn't work quite as well as it did when I was testing it because we got a little, we got a little something, something down there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my lasso tool and I am going to cut away, cut away, cut away, just like that. There we go, that's close enough. And what I wanna do to just kinda of soften the edge, the edge really doesn't matter a whole lot because we're gonna only be taking a slice of this. But again, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. So we're gonna go modify, contract. We're gonna contract this bad boy about two pixels right there. See that contracted by two pixels? We'll hit okay. And then we're gonna go select, modify. And we're gonna feather this. And you can go one or two pixels. I, mean, I think I'm gonna go with one. And we're just gonna invert the selection and delete the background. Um, you could, well, you know what, let's do it the right way. Let's just mask it. Let's add a mask. There we go, we've added the mask. We've got our piece of orange. Uh, things are looking good. Now what we need to do is, I think I'm gonna size the orange down a little bit, Command or Control T, and I wanna basically make it as wide as the, the bottom part of the glass, maybe a little wider. So I'll go something like that. There we go, something like that will probably work for us. We can always tweak and adjust it a little bit later. 
and all I need to do is command or control click on my orange uh, orange juice slice lower. So command or control click that layer thumbnail. There's our selection. That's the piece of orange that we need. And by the way, it's not like blemishes on the orange. It's just our water splashing up in front of it. Uh, and this is the only piece of the mask that I need to save. So I'll select the mask. I will invert this selection by going select inverse. And I'm going to fill every other part of the mask except this little slot with black. So we can go edit fill. And we can say, yeah, for the contents, we're going to go, we're going to go with a little black here. We're going to hit OK. And then Command or Control D to deselect. And we've got a slice of orange juice. Now, you may be looking at it saying, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> uh, we got a shadow here, but the shadow on the glass is over here. To which I would reply, you're right. And here's how we can fix that. Hit the little link icon between the orange and the mask. And then make sure you select the orange layer itself again. And then hit Command or Control T, right click. And we can just try to flip this horizontally. Something like that. Maybe I can stretch it out a little bit and say, eh, get more, get me more of that shadow over there, you know, as long as it's still looking somewhat believable. Now we're gonna be doing some dodging and burning and cleaning things up a little bit more, but you know, let's get it as right as we can before we have to go and just paste effects and stuff on top of it anyway. Um, we're gonna do one more slice of orange here and then we'll take a couple more questions. All right, so I am going to just duplicate this orange, hold down Alter Option, and I'm gonna drag, I'm just gonna drag it right up above here. I'm gonna get rid of the mask altogether. And here's probably where, I probably didn't even need to select the orange now that I'm thinking about it. Because if I get it in place and I command or control click like on the higher slot like that, and then I just hit add a mask, that, that would have been the faster way to do it. Um, but you know, sometimes I think about these things on the fly and not when I'm spending all the time uh, <laughs> pre-running a tutorial. <laughs> all right, now I'm gonna hit command or control T again. I've de detached it from the mask. And I think I wanna try moving it over a little bit. Maybe I'll make this one a little bit bigger. So what that's gonna do is it's just gonna vary the texture. We don't want it to look like exactly the same orange. So by doing that, we just vary the texture enough that hopefully it's kind of like, okay, you know, two different slices of presumably the same orange. Um, and you know, it looks, it looks like it should. So there we go, we have two slices of orange and uh, I'm gonna lock the oranges back to the layer mask because we are going to have to move these slices of orange in just a moment. So I want to make sure that the orange and layer mask are locked together. So if I like shift this orange over, the whole piece moves with the mask. If I didn't do that and I selected the orange and moved it over, you see it moves independently of the mask. So we want the whole thing to move as one joined unit. Michael, do we have any questions? We have questions about resolution. Okay. Everyone's favorite topic. Yeah. First question. Titillating. <laughs> right. Why 144 PPI as opposed to 150? Uh, it, honestly, it was just, it was what I had in there for whatever the last project I was working on and I just didn't change it. Uh, normally there would be some, uh, there would be some reason to use like 96 or 72 or 144 or 150. Uh, the, honestly, for this, there's no real, no real good reason. It's yeah. just what was in there. Cool. Yeah. And then uh, about upscaling resolution from 72 to 300 or any um, mm -hmm. higher pixel count uh, without losing quality. Uh, work work with high quality assets right. and convert them all to smart objects. So if you um, let me give you an example, actually, I'm going to I'm going to open up. Um, I don't know. Let's open up this photo of San Francisco. Which, by the way, I had a, a a San Francisco catalog delivered to my room last night, and this exact Adobe stock photo was used in the magazine, and I picked it out because I've been using it a lot right. for a series of tutorials that I've been using. I was like, hey, I recognize that. Nice, good images um, on Adobe stuff. <laughs> exactly. So this photo is 2700 by 1519 at a resolution of 300 pixels per inch, right? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and convert this to a smart object. And let's take our image and we're gonna just downsize. Let's, uh, let's say like 72 pixels per inch. You can see that's gonna knock me down to 648 by 365. I'm gonna hit okay. All right, now this is, this is my image now at 100%. And I said to the client, and they're like, well, are you kidding me? 72 pixels per inch, how dare you, good sir? Uh, okay, the client makes a point. Well, I can come back in here to image size, and I can say, you know what? Yeah, let's push it back to 300, and I can hit okay. And because it's a smart object, it brings me right back to where I was, and I don't get all that crazy blurriness, loss of fidelity, because a smart object preserves all that detail. So if you work with a huge image to begin with, convert it to a smart object, then size it down or resize your image in Photoshop, whatever it is you're doing, you can always blow it back up at least to that size. A lot of times too, you can kind of fudge it and make stuff a little bit bigger than it was, but just be careful doing that, especially if you're getting something printed. You don't want to have it printed and realize, oh no, this looks positively dreadful. Um, but that's... Um, so it's all about working non-destructively and when doing so, smart objects are your friend. Exactly, yeah. And smart objects make it very, very easy to work with a really high fidelity image 
uh, or graphic or anything. You can drag in a smart object from Adobe Illustrator um, and size it down. Whether you're sizing using free transform in Photoshop itself or whether you're actually just wholesale changing the size of your entire Photoshop document, the smart object is gonna, it's, it can go both ways. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real beautiful thing and it's very nice to have that, uh, that flexibility. And the smart object let you do that. Cool. That was it for our questions. Cool. We love answering them. We'll be taking a couple minutes to answer some more. Quick reminder to keep working on your challenge. We're about 30 minutes, a half hour away from taking a look at those. So if you're cranking away on that, keep going. Make sure you export it and submit it um, well ahead of the deadline. We've got about 35 minutes left. We'll take a look at those. We do have a few good puns in the uh, <laughs> in the chat. So we like seeing those too. Aren't you glad you can catch all these juicy tips? Well, there you go. And then Noel I mean, says, I couldn't have said it better myself. I, exactly. I sure am glad to have caught these tips. If you keep watching, you will vitamin C all the tips and tricks. That one's a bit of a stretch. It's a little bit of a stretch. But keep I have stretching. to point, points yeah, for creativity. Right. Points for creativity. Keep the creative orange juices flowing. Right. Please keep the puns coming. We'll recite them. Yes. We might make it a completely new segment here on Adobe right. Live. There you go. We're going to get back into the work here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as I've had a moment to Look at what we've uh, look at what we've done so far. The oranges, the slices of orange on the the juice glass are a bit more orange than the juice itself. The juice is looking pretty yellow in comparison. So we want to change that a little bit. But we also we need to. I want to split the juice glass up onto it onto its own layers, like each slice of juice glass. So this bottom piece will be its own layer, the middle slice and the top slice, and we'll stack it around the oranges. So here's how we're going to do that. I am going to grab my polygonal lasso tool. And I'm going to shut off the oranges just so this is very easy to see what I'm doing. I'm going to create a selection around the top piece of the glass, right? Just like this, this whole bit. Boom. And we're going to use that same little trick, Command-Shift-J. Boom. Now the top piece of the glass up on its own layer. So I'm going to call this Top OJ, and I'm going to drag it up to the top. There we go. Now for the second piece of the glass, we want to go middle. And just, you know, doesn't have to be an exact selection at all. Just enough to get the job done. Command-Shift. And we're going to call this OJ Mid. Uh, okay, I should probably, in following with what I did, I'm going to go mid OJ. There we go. Naming conventions are important. Mm -hmm. So now we've got top OJ, we've got top orange slice, we've got mid OJ, we've got mid orange slice, and then we've got the bottom of the glass, which, oh, by the way, retains the layer mask. So you can see it is, in fact, just the bottom piece of the glass. So now that we've done that, I want to begin changing the color of these uh, pieces of the glass. So I'm going to select top OJ here, and I'm going to hit Command or Control U. We're going to apply a totally destructive edit. Um, just because I don't want to have to clip a hue saturation adjustment layer to all these layers. I'm pretty sure this is what I want to do um, and how I want to do this. I want to knock the hue back. So you can see with this hue slider, the way this works is while the hue slider currently says you're at cyan, it's actually relative. So we know that on our layer we have majority maybe yellow, right? So the direction I know I need to move the hue slider is back toward the oranges and reds. So despite the fact that I'm over cyan, if I Start, start subtracting hue, you can see the orange juice is becoming orange and red and pink and, you know, hey, now it's uh, blue raspberry, right? That's a little it's, ridiculous yeah. <laughs> though, uh, but actually kind of cool. And you can go with like a grapefruit juice like that, right? Or maybe like that, more grapefruity. I'm just going to go negative 10 on the hue and I think I'm going to go like plus 20 on the saturation and I'm going to hit OK, right? And I turn the orange on. That's pretty close. What do you, what do you say? Yeah, yeah. I think that's pretty close. So I'm going to go mid OJ. Now here's a cool trick because we just use regular old hue saturation. Instead of just hitting Command or Control and U to bring up uh, to bring up hue saturation, we can go Command Option or Control Alt and the letter U. It's going to bring up hue saturation with our last used settings. So just very quickly, I can apply this orangeness across my last couple layers. Voila, just like that. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to take top slice orange and I'm going to zoom in. And I want these orange slices to look like they're shifting off to one side or the other, but more importantly, I want them to look like they're coming toward the camera. And when you're working with something like this perspective-wise, with the camera angle we have on this glass, to make it look like it's moving toward the camera, we need to shift the object straight down. That's going to give the illusion that it's moving toward the camera. So I'm going to select this. I'm going to uh, hit the letter V to switch to my Move tool. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this uh, 140 pixels to the left. So I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then I'm going to move it maybe like 20 pixels down. So 1, 2. There's 20 pixels down. It looks really bad because we haven't put our fill in. But wait, wait till you see what happens when we put this fill in. Just wait. It is like magic. 
All right, we're going to select this. And this one, I'm going to go to my right, and I'm going to go uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2. So it's 120 pixels to my right. And then uh, I'll probably just go 20 pixels down, something like that. Yeah, 20 pixels down. That's probably fine. Maybe for the, the top orange, I'll nudge it upward. So we'll just go down 10 pixels with that. Uh, so I think that I think that looks about right. Now what we need to do is we need to license an image from Adobe Stock that we can use to create the fill of both the glass and the slices of orange. This is pretty cool. We're going to open up the libraries. And this, by the way, is part of the value of using Adobe Stock over any of the other guys that are out there. I have an unlicensed Adobe Stock image here in my library. I can take it out. And I can say, mm -hmm, yeah, I think this is pretty much what I want. Uh, I'm going to maybe size it down just a little bit like that. Commit the change. I'm going to try using select object on this as well, so, or select subject, excuse me. Let's see if it does. I mean, there is a bit of orange ringiness around it. So I think it'll do a pretty good job. Yeah, look at that. Pretty, nice. pretty, pretty yep. stinking good. And I'm going to go ahead and apply a mask to this. And there we go. We have our piece of orange. This is what's going to become the fill of the juice glass. Problem is, uh, we have this thing right across the middle, Adobe Stock, and we don't we don't necessarily want that. So I'm going to go back to my libraries now that I've decided from the sample image that I do in fact want it. I can right click, choose, yeah, go ahead and license this image, and it's going to connect to Adobe Stock. See my account and say you've got 19 or 27 licenses, whatever left. And I'm going to say, yep, use one of those licenses. Voila! It now appears in my library with a blue check, which is a beautiful site. And if we watch here. The, it'll automatically update in our document. So this Adobe logo will go away right there. Yeah. The mask is still there. Everything is in place. Everything is retained. Ah, <sighs> doesn't that feel good? <laughs> All right. We can go ahead now and drag this orange slice. Well, let me shut the orange slice off for a second. So again, touching on what we touched on a moment ago, we need basically four pieces of orange. We need one for in here. We need one for in here. We need one for the top of this slice. And we need one for right here. So we need to duplicate this orange four times, but I think I want to kind of lay it down flat first, play with the perspective, get it kind of moved into place, and make sure our slices are looking good, and then we'll go ahead and duplicate it once we've got that perspective because the, pers the perspective is going to remain the same. So I'm going to turn my orange slice on. I'm going to hit Command or Control T, and uh, I'm going to downsize this, holding down Shift and Option. That's Shift and Alt. There we go. Zoom in on this a little bit. Let me zoom on. Just did and undid what I did in, in one. <laughs> One fell swoop. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And what I want to do first is right click here within Free Transform and I want to choose Perspective. And I'm going to grab my top handle, so either one of these top handles, and I'm going to pinch it inward. That's going to start laying the orange down flat. Problem is it's way too tall, so we'll go back to Free Transform and we'll say, yeah, squat yourself down like that. It's still, it's too big and it's too wide and it's not flat enough. I'm going to right click. I'm going to go back to perspective. We're going to perspective it a little bit more. There we go. Kind of until we get it sort of in line with our glass. Maybe I need to be, oh, maybe I need to be a little bit wider. I'm going to right click free transform. Go ahead and scale this down a little bit. Now snapping is still turned on. I think that's going to be a little bit annoying for what we're doing here because this, I entirely want to do this by eye. So I'm just going to shut snapping off. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I might even shut off the top orange juice, and I can't do that here while I'm in free transform. So I'm going to stretch this out. I think this needs to be moved down a little more. It needs to be put pinched in a little bit more. And I think I need to play with the perspective. I think perspective needs to come back out a little bit. Something like that. And then right click free transform. We'll pinch this in just, ah, just maybe like that. And then this side probably needs to come over a little bit. I'm going to kind of go guessing game. And then I'm going to commit that change. I'm going to shut off the top piece of orange juice, which I should have done before. Commander Control T here, and uh, I'm just going to nudge this side of the orange in a little bit like that. I'm going to push the bottom piece of the orange up a little and then just nudge it down. We want to kind of make this look as convincing as possible. So I'm just going to nudge this over. That's better. And then I'm going to nudge this side over. And this is, you know, just a labor of love, man. Just well, a labor of love. Well, while you're laboring, I think we've I feel like we've reached the pinnacle of the pun game, and this one comes from Noah. He says, piracy and unlicensed orange slices lead to scurvy. So we've addressed Adobe stock unlicensed imaging. We've addressed orange puns. Everything. I'm just going to go ahead like and the hand out an award shop. for that one. Thank it's you, the Noah. The ones to hop shop there. <laughs> I'm just cleaning up this edge of the orange there with the mask, and I'm going to hit Commander Control T again. And I'm gonna, I think I'm going to nudge it inward a little bit. I keep right-clicking because I'm leaving a second finger on my touchpad. That probably won't be happening to you. I'm going to nudge the orange downward. There we go. And then 
hit the letter V to switch to my selection tool, and then just nudge it down one. And that it pays. looks pretty realistic. Yeah. And we haven't even began adding the edge and, and, and the edge shadow and highlight detail, but it's gonna make a difference. All right, so this is gonna be, we're gonna call this O slice uh, one because this is sort of the top piece. And I need to move it down beneath the top orange juice, right? And you're gonna see, right? Whoa, hello, hello. Now we're, now we're cooking with smart. fire. That's right. I'm going to shut off these top layers and I'm going to hold down alter option and duplicate this orange slice down, turn it back on, and we're gonna align it as best we can to this part of the glass. Now remember, the glass is getting narrower as we move down the flute. So we're gonna have to adjust each of these orange slices. No problem. As somebody in the chat pointed out, aren't you glad you tuned in or something like that? <laughs> I'm gonna just make this a little smaller. I'm really bad with puns. We got a, a pretty deep one, which is in an alternate universe. Nathaniel is creating sliced apple juice on an orange computer. <laughs> well, there, that is. It just keeps getting It almost made my mind yeah. short circuit there for right? a second. We had to think about that. For but that's a good second. one. It's great. Well, kudos to you, sir or ma'am. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep moving down the slice hierarchy here. While he's doing that, while we're talking about challenges, uh, not pun challenges, but today's daily challenge, make sure that you are creating um, your infographic, health-related infographic. If you want to make it orange juice themed, it's probably still a healthy Do a breakdown enough. of the minerals yeah. and vitamins in orange juice. Exactly. But the problem is now if you do that, there's probably someone else in the chat doing it. So just uh, make yours look. Make yours about apple juice. Uh, yeah. Or grape juice. <laughs> Remember to submit those in the next 20 minutes. We've got about 23 minutes, but if you start submitting, exporting at, in, in 20 minutes, you should be able to get it in on time. We'll be taking a look at those, talking about them, talking about our favorites. The winner's gonna win a one-year subscription to Creative Cloud for free. That's, That's an incredible right. value. You can get in, jump into Photoshop and get some Adobe stock images and make some tasty composites like we're doing exactly. today. And, and it's free. You can't argue that it's not a good value. No, it's free. yeah, it's kind of hard to argue that. <laughs> Come on. Um, and please submit some questions. Um, very knowledgeable. Nathaniel is very knowledgeable about Photoshop. Um, pretty much, I, I struggle to think that there's a question you couldn't answer about Photoshop. And that might be our third challenge. Michael, today. I have to confess, I'm just voicing over a pre-recorded video that somebody else I know did. They just send me out here. I'm to be the face <laughs> and the voice. Just a grave mistake to send me uh -huh. out to be the face of anything. All right, let's turn that back on. All right, so there's our the base of our glass. Here's our first slice. Here's the second piece of the glass. Here's our second slice. And here's the top piece of the gl 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 glass. There we go. And what I want to do is I need to give these oranges, the, the slices, they need a little breathing room because right now it's like they are just scorched right in there and it looks like you need some, you know, some channel locks to get those things pried out of there. So in order to do that, what I want to do is select let me create another layer. So it's so much easier to just draw on screen. I want to select this whole bit, right? These three, these three bits of elements, and move them upward, probably about 20 pixels. Okay. So, with this still on screen, I'm going to select top OJ. I'm going to select the first slice of orange and the mid uh, slice of glass. Hold down Shift. I need to make sure I grab my selection tool. Hold down shift, I've got all these layers selected. Hold down shift and nudge up one and nudge up two. Great. Now what we need to do, I'm gonna get rid of my drawing. We now need to just simply take the top piece of glass and this also needs to go up about 20 pixels. Have I made myself clear? All right, we're gonna grab the selection tool and I'm just gonna nudge up one and two while holding down shift. And now we've given this a little bit of breathing room. It still doesn't quite look that way because we haven't applied our shadows and stuff yet. Um, but uh, wait until we add those shadows. It's, it's going to be, be pretty yeah. epic. Do we have more questions? We do not have more okay. questions. We would love more questions. Yeah, give me some questions, guys. Get some questions up there in the chat. Some challenging ones or simple ones. Whatever you'd like to know, whether it's related to this document, um, these techniques. We're going through all the techniques. I mean, layer masking, transforming, perspective warp, color adjustments, pretty much everything. Yeah, pretty much everything. You need to make a convincing composite in Photoshop. That's right. All right, so let's begin adding some shadowy stuff here. And uh, the way I'm going to do this is, number one, you just want to keep in mind like the natural flow of a shadow, right? Shadows are generally cast down or away from the light source. So we want to keep that in mind, but we are probably going to break the rules a little bit because as you can see here, like the light is coming camera left 
into the scene, at least the primary, uh, well, what would be the key light probably if they're not counting, it's probably the key light, let's not overthink this. Um, yet here we still have a bit of a deep shadow being cast almost as if the light's coming in camera right. But it still looks kind of cool. So I'm gonna just kind of follow through with that thought process despite the fact that it's not necessarily as real as it should be. Did I take my oranges opposite? Well, look at that. See, we're doing, we're doing a little different today, boys and girls. Uh, <laughs> we're going off okay. the cuff. I'm gonna go ahead and I am going to select the layer mask for the top orange slice. You can see there when I selected the orange itself, I got everything on the layer, which includes that white background, which we've masked away. So I'm gonna command or control click the layer mask. And I want the first shadow to be beneath the top OJ, but on top of this top slice of orange, because there should be just, just a little bit of a shadow there underneath that top piece of the juice glass. So I'm gonna create a new layer, and I wanna fill this selection with a pretty specific color. Uh, so I'm gonna first fill it with black, and I think I'm just gonna use like hue saturation to get my color. So Commander Control D to deselect, and I'm gonna name this uh, shadow underscore one. And I misspelled that, shadow underscore one. Now, with, with the shadow, generally shadows are not black. They look black to us, but unless it's being cast by or onto or by and onto a black or very dark gray object, you don't really have a black, black shadow. The shadow is gonna assume some of the light or color of the object onto which it's being cast uh, in most regular situations. So I wanna change the color of, the, of my shadow here to a very dark orange. So I'm gonna hit Commander Control U to bring up my hue saturation. And I think I'm gonna tick on colorize because swinging the hue of something that has no hue, it's black, isn't gonna do us much good. I could adjust the lightness, but obviously that's not, that's not what we want. So I'm gonna turn on colorize here and I want, to, I want to set the hue to kind of an orange. Now here, by the way, once you work with colorize, if I crank the saturation up to 100 and I bring the lightness up, now the hue slider is literal. We're at red, I wanna make it blue, let's drag it right to the blue, right? So that's the difference between using hue saturation when you're modifying an existing color versus colorizing an object uh, that you're, you're selecting or attacking in this way that we are. So we know that we, we kind of want our, our shadow to be pretty orange, pretty orange, maybe bordering on kind of red orange, right? Like a very fiery orange red. And I'm gonna go with uh, 100, 100 for my saturation. And then for my brightness, I need to make this quite a bit darker. So I'm gonna go maybe like 20 pixels for lightness. So 15, 120 is probably a good way to think about it. Hit OK, and there we go. We have our first shadow, but it doesn't look like a shadow. So we need to go filter, we need to go blur, we need to go Gaussian blur. Um, and I'll probably, 200 pixels is a little, that's a bit much. Uh, maybe 20, that's also a bit much. I'm gonna nudge this down, let's try 10. Ooh, 10's pretty close, maybe like seven. Let's try seven pixels. And then I'm gonna move this over, move it over, move it over. Kind of something a little bit like that. Now I see, I think seven maybe wasn't quite enough. Let's go back to filter. Let's go blur. And I'm gonna keep my mind. So we just did seven. Maybe I'll do seven more. Maybe I'll do 10 more. Yeah, yeah, I think I'll do 10 more. I think I'm gonna roll with 10 more. And there's our first shadow, but it, it looks pretty dreadful. And you're right about that. What we wanna do is clip it to the layer beneath. So we're clipping it to the surface of our orange layer. So command option or control alt G. And now our shadow is just cast on what would normally be uh, getting a shadow cast upon it. So that looks pretty good. Now what I wanna do is duplicate this shadow. So I'm gonna hold down Alter Option. I'm gonna drag this down because now what we wanna do is get the shadow that is being cast by this protruding orange slice. So I drag this down. I'm gonna hit Command or Control T. Let's maybe make the shadow a, a bit bigger, which is gonna kind of show off some of the softness of it a little bit more. Maybe we'll tilt it on a little bit of an angle. I move it under there like that. Maybe nudge it back this way a little bit. What I'm trying to be careful of is I wanna make sure there's not too much showing beyond this far right edge. This stuff up here, that's gonna get masked away. I'm concerned about stuff that is being cast onto the face of the juice glass that's going beyond the far right edge of this orange. We can manually mask it after the fact if we have to, and we may have to, but I'm just gonna get this into a position that makes, the most important part is over here, right? I, wa I wanna make this look the best. So I'm gonna go ahead and commit that change, and then I'm gonna clip this not to this top orange slice, I'm gonna clip it to the face of the glass. So Command, Option, or Control, Alt, and the letter G, and there you go, we've, we've now cast the shadow from this piece of orange, and uh, you know what, that doesn't, I gotta move this up, because we still want a little bit to be cast on the orange itself. You know what, here's what we'll do. We're going to simply load this as a selection, and we're gonna apply a standard layer mask, because now with the standard layer mask, 
I can go and paint the shadow in where I want it to be. I'm gonna make my brush a little bit bigger. I'm gonna paint with white. And we say, yeah, give me, give me a little shadow action there. And uh, just get rid of, get rid of shadow that's going just a little bit too much off this way, right? So we can kind of have the shadow cut off a little bit. And you can see we just have a nice, a nice little shadow. Now maybe I should go a little, add a little bit more of an angle. Maybe something more like that. There we go. It looks a little bit more realistic. And, and also, by the way, you can always go into any of these shadows. If I need to loosen up the saturation a little bit, maybe knock it down to 90, I can do that. I can knock this one down to 90, just like that. That's, that's good. And I'm going to continue creating these shadows now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and duplicate the shadow that's already laying flat up here. Alter option, drag it down. And I want this to be, let's see, I want this shadow to be cast onto the face of this orange, which is that piece right there. So that's perfect. I'm going to drag this shadow down and I'll probably stick it right, right about there, something like that. The, the further downward you move the shadow, the more you're going to have an illusion of a greater gap between the slices of orange. So I'm going to command option or control alt G that. I think that looks pretty good. Yeah. That gives us a nice like slice variation. I may reduce the opacity of this slice a little bit more, maybe knock it down to 80. Maybe 85, I'll go 85%. And now we have uh, another shadow to add beneath this slice of orange. So I think I'm gonna go with the stretched out shadow that I've already created. So I'm gonna alter option. No, you know, I'm not gonna do that because we got the layer mask and everything. I'm just gonna alter option, drag this down, and I'm gonna place it just above the bottom base of our orange juice. I'm gonna move it over, Commander Control T. Let's make it a bit larger as we have been doing. I'm gonna rock this into place. Kind of tilt it over. Maybe I'll stretch it upward a little bit. Something kind of, sort of, like that. And we're going to clip this to the bottom piece of orange juice. Command option or control alt G, just like that. You can see we now have a, a crazy series of shadows that are really helping build out this effect for us. Before we go on, Michael, do we have any? We do not have any new no questions. questions. Chat is chat is not being cooperative today. They're talking no, about kidding. ambient. You guys are, you guys are always being ambient. <laughs> oh, occlusion. Uh-huh. I'm not sure what that is. It allows you to simulate the soft shadows that occur in the cracks and crevices of your 3D objects when indirect lighting is cast onto your scene. That sounds complex. Yes. <laughs> but hey. And here we are if creating it does it. realistic shadows. If it does it, man. Using Gaussian blur <laughs> and clipping masks. Exactly. All right, so uh, what I want to do now is create a dodge and burn layer. And we're going to do a few things with the dodge and burn layer. We're going to infuse a little drama into the scene by giving the glass a little bit more shape, making it appear almost smoother. And we're also going to build a very small highlight and shadow edge on the sort of the cut edges we've created. So they don't just bam, end with just this jagged edge of pixel cuts. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of clean them up a little bit. Actually, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here before I zoom in. Uh, I want to create, I'll probably create my dodge and burn layer here beneath the, the splash of water because we can. I'm gonna create a new layer. I'm gonna name the layer D and B. I'm gonna go edit, fill, and we're gonna go 50% gray, just like that. I'm gonna hit okay. Hey, my image disappeared. Uh, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna set this to the blend mode of overlay. So overlay just knocks away anything that's 50% gray and it preserves anything that's lighter or darker and it sort of applies it to the image below. So now with this dodge and burn layer, if I grab my dodging tool and I paint directly on the dodge and burn layer, I will simply brighten that area. Now I'm working with uh, mid, mid tones as my range and an exposure of 20%. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in just a touch here. And I'm gonna begin down here. I'm gonna brighten up this highlight, right? Just like that. And I'm gonna come up here, well, not the top yet. Let's, let's fix up the highlight here on the edge of the orange, try to kind of get it to match the highlight that's going down to the bottom part of the glass. I'll hit the highlight on the other side of the orange over here. And then right through here, we'll add a little highlight there. I'm gonna brighten up the surface of that orange there. Really tweak the highlight there on the edge of the orange. That's good. And then I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna brighten up this side of the glass. And specifically, I'll make the brush smaller using my square bracket keys. I'll really target, really target those highlights just like that. So this Looking is good. a technique to use dodge and burn non-destructively. Normally, this isn't this this applied. honestly this isn't even the most non-destructive way to use dodge and burn. But yes, this would be a non-destructive way. Um, the best non-destructive way to use dodge and burn. It doesn't really make sense for this image, but we still could use it. The best way to dodge and burn non-destructively is to add two curves layers and set the top one to screen and then fill the mask with black and set the bottom one to multiply 
and uh, not color burn, multiply, and fill the mask with black. And then what you would do is you would take your brush tool, set it to an opacity of like 10%, and paint with white, leave low 100%, paint with white, oh, you son of a gun. There we go, paint with white for the third or fourth time. Make the brush a little bit bigger. Uh, now we're painting in the shadows, so we would just paint some of that darkness in. And the beauty of this is you can go and let's say that it, it's coming through like you have something. I, and I know people who dodge and burn this way, actually. You could say like, I want this to be darker. I want this to be darker. I want this to be darker. I want that to be darker. I want to darken here like this. Ding, 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 right? And I want a little darkness over there, a little bit there, and maybe a little along that edge. And then because everything is locked into this mask here, you can simply Gaussian blur the mask and get a perfect, and get a perfect, uh, you know, a bit of, of burning to whatever extent you want. Wow. Right? So you can go like with a very, a very sort of constricted blur or, or, or burn, excuse me, or something that's very soft and kind of far reaching. And you can see there's before, there's after. So it's very subtle. And the other nice thing about this is if there's not enough burning, Commander Control J, Commander Control J, and you can amp up the burn, if you will, doing something like that. So that's that's more non-destructive because number one, you're painting on a layer mask that, and, and you're splitting, you're dodging from your burning. So you can edit them, you can reduce or increase the opacity of either one, duplicate either one individually, blur either one individually, or just straight up get rid of either one individually. The reason I didn't do that here is because this just takes a little bit less time. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty well, much Well, and that requires some thinking, like inverse thinking, and you're wondering, yeah. you're painting white on yeah. a dodge, on a yeah. burn layer and darkening. That's true, that's true, <laughs> that's true. That's the real reason. That was a great it. tip, though, yeah. Two, two new methods to use dodge and burn non-destructively, exactly. typically some of the most destructive so processes gonna, you can gonna, do in Photoshop. <laughs> and there's, you can do a lot of bad <laughs> dodging right. and burning. But it can be really helpful if it's done well. It's, it, but it's hard to do it well. I mean, there's still images that I'll look at and be like, what yeah. was I thinking? All right, so now that we kind of have done our dodging, there's before, there's after, I want to do some burning. So I'm just going to make my brush a bit bigger using the right square bracket. And you don't have to switch tools. You don't have to go to the burn tool. You can just hold down alter option while using the dodge tool. And it's going to automatically kind of switch you to your burn tool. And I can go in and accentuate shadows and, and stuff like that. Maybe come down along here. Voila. Do something kind of, sort of, like that. That's pretty cool. Looking good. Feeling good. There's before, there's after. So we've made a, a pretty massive difference with our dodging and burning. And if it's too much, of course, you can just reduce the opacity a little bit. I don't want to do that quite yet. I want to mess around with my edges. So a lot of times, if, if the very fine edge of an object bends down and in away from the light, you're going to get a very subtle shadow along that edge. But if it flutes out a little bit, it's like a little catch for light. So in that case, you would have to have a little highlight. Now, I think what I'm going to choose to do here is for the glass, in my head, presumably we have a high-powered laser cutter or something that gives us a clean, beautiful cut, right? So any edge is going to be sort of bent inward, therefore there's going to be a little shadow along that edge. But with the oranges, we would have an edge going the opposite direction, so we'll have a little highlight along the top of our oranges. So the idea would be along the the bottom of the object, we'll put a little uh, a little highlight, excuse me. Along the top of an object, we'll put a little shadow, uh, or vice versa. We'll see what looks good, I guess. That's what we'll do. We'll see what looks good. You have a new name. It's Nathaniel Byrne Dodgson. <laughs> Thank you, <Jim. laughs> All right, so we're going to go along here. We're going to try just giving this a little highlight. And I'm just painting multiple strokes with a very soft-edged burn tool. If you really wanted to make this precise, really the way to do it is use the pen tool and just trace along the path or repurpose one of those paths, the ellipse paths we created earlier, and just stroke that path and mask it into place. But we're going to kind of, again, we're, we're, we're saying that we're going for the more organic feel, but in this case it's just because I don't, I don't really feel like doing that. All right, so we've got that. That looks pretty good. I, I think, I kind of think it should be the burn. I'm going to open up my history panel here, and I'm just going to go back to when I toggled layer visibility to get rid of all that dodging and burning. Let's try burning this. So I'm going to switch to my burn tool. There we go. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller, 400 pixels, a little large for what we've got happening here. And I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to paint along this. You know, so again, a little bit of a labor of love. There we go. Whoop, too much there. Too much there. 
And you, you also notice if I paint with the dodge tool up here, it's too dark. If I paint down here, it's even darker. So it, 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 it kind of reads and reacts to what you're working on. Now my exposure is 50%, that's probably too much. Let's take this down to like 20. 50 is ridiculous. Because we can always go over a spot twice if we need to. Subtle edits to get you exactly. where you're going. Exactly. Multiple layers. Photoshop, I mean, isn't the essence of Photoshop layers? I feel like it's the first thing you think about. And, and layers don't just have to be your actual layers in your layer panel. They can be the idea of layering on an effect. Yeah, I think that right. looks a bit better. In fact, what I think I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave this like, ah, no, I'm not gonna leave it like that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna undo that. You know what he says, if it's worth doing, it's, it's worth, worth doing, doing right. right, exactly. And, the, and I'm the one who came up with that saying. <laughs> We're gonna create a new dodge and burn layer for this just because I feel like I'm going to want to um, blur this a little bit and I don't wanna have to mess around and, and blur all the other dodging and burning. So we just create that new layer and then I'll just come through here real quick. Nice and, and just kinda, yeah, exactly. So while Nathaniel's doing that, we've got about five minutes left for our challenge submissions. They are due in five minutes, so if you're, if you're working on it, go ahead and wrap up the work, uh, put the finishing touches on it, make sure to export it. Um, let's see, export it as a JPEG, probably a PNG as well. Okay, either PNG or JPEG, um, and upload the infographic to the link in the challenge tab. We're gonna be taking a look at those in about five minutes, picking our favorite, and that favorite will win a one-year subscription to Creative Cloud for free, oh, yeah. which is great. Um, so make sure that you're uh, wrapping up that and submitting it to us. It looks like we've got, we've got quite a few submissions so far. Nice. Um, yeah. All right, I'm just, I'm applying the shadow to the bottom of all these pieces. I'm gonna go back and apply the highlight to the top in a little bit. I'm just trying to do one piece at a time. You know, I just recently did this um, multitasking test, I think is what it was called. Hmm. And it's it you you print out this sheet and you do you perform the same task twice, uh, but on the the non multitasking iteration of it, you focus all of your energy on doing both tasks individually, but then you do one step of each task at the same time, and it shows you how much less efficient you are when you multitask. I am according to that I am three times less efficient when I multitask. Wow. It took me three times as long to do the same two tasks when I was trying to multitask is when I just dedicated myself to one and then did the other. Has that changed how you work? I now? mean, a bit, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I still work too many hours a day, but I feel like I'm getting more done. And then we ask you to come Crazy. on, do a, an awesome composite, talk about what you're doing, <laughs> answer random questions, and respond to some of the most amazing puns that I've heard exactly. today. Well, that's why we're, that's why we're taking breaks to answer <laughs> the right. questions. <laughs> there we go, cool. That's the top of that piece. We're gonna add a little highlighty action to the top of this piece. And yeah, this is where I look at it. It's, it's gonna need a very, very subtle blur. One or two pixels, not much, but it's just, you know, these are those details that just, they just add that little level of va-va-voom. Um, so here, if I, if I just shut this dodge burn layer off, we can see there's before, there's after. So you can see yeah. it's, just, it's just building out those edges, that little bit, as they should be. A hint of dimension, kind of. Exactly. Just, it's that realism. Because yep. there's always that little bit of something, when, especially when you're working with composites. One little thing can make something go from looking totally fake to, whoa, that is a very convincing Absolutely. composite. Absolutely. Um, as we saw, again, harkening back to when we masked the glass behind the water, that one little change. All right, I'm going to select this dodge and burn layer. I'm going to go burn. I'm going to go Gaussian blur and maybe like two pixels. Um, and see, it's very helpfully giving me uh, a good idea of what it's gonna look like. So I can see that I can say, no, I probably want more like four, something like that. And then I'll probably duplicate this layer, Command or Control J, just to build that out. So there's before, there's after. We just have a nice little edge we've placed on these. And I think with the duplicate, I might, I might blur it one more time and just reduce the opacity. So I just went up here and I hit filter, Gaussian blur, I just use the hotkey, uh, which for me is, is another annoying thing. I gotta change this with the latest update in uh, Photoshop. This used to just be Command or Control F, but now it's telling me Control Command F, because if I hit Command F, I get this like search for Adobe something or other, which I literally never use. This I used all the time, and that's what got changed. But that's something I can go and change in my keyboard shortcuts. Right. But that doesn't really have anything to do with this tutorial. <laughs> um, all right, what do we have left to do here? We have to, oh, let's add a little bit of text. How much time did you say we have uh, there, Michael? We've got 55 seconds. 55 yeah. seconds. For, for the submissions to be due, we might take okay. another minute after that to kind of wrap up and um, then okay. we'll take a look at them. Okay, okay, cool. So I would add some text above this. 
Um, but before I add the text, I want to just add a LUT. So I'm going to, uh, this is going to be sort of the finishing color to this whole thing. I'm going to add a color lookup table adjustment layer. We can talk about the text later if we have time. That really didn't, that's, you know. Oh, you meant how much full time do we have? Yeah. Yeah, we've got about 20, th almost 30 oh, okay, minutes, like perfect. 25 minutes. Here. Okay, okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to load up my LUTs here and I'm going to go with the Kodak. Um, I'm going to try the F125, the Fuji F125 Kodak 2395. Let's see what that looks like. That's kind of cool. It gives us a nice, like, faded vibe. I'm going to try the 2393. I kind of, I think I like the 2395 a little bit more. Just kind of opens up those shadows a little bit. Uh, and the beauty of these uh, color lookup tables, it's an adjustment layer. So like anything else, you can reduce that opacity. You can increase the opacity, um, anything like that. I might reduce the opacity just a little bit, something like that. And then to top things off, I may just throw like a curves adjustment on top of it and just knock the shadows down a little and boost the highlights just a touch. I'll pull the highlights down just a tiny bit there. And one last thing, we way early on when we added the water, we clipped this levels adjustment to the water where we really boosted the blacks. I think the boost was a little too much. So let's just bring that back to maybe about an output of 33. And that's just going to add a little bit more shape and dimension to the water while we're at it. Um, and uh, we can take a break now. Let's do it. If okay. We're ready to check out yeah, some I'm going to pull these up. I'm going to save my document. Yeah, we well, should save it. <laughs> One question, how did you learn to make the shadows and know where to put them? So you want to talk about the it's shadows? It's all about bit? direction of light. Um, so very early on in my career, if you want to call it that, I still, when you're having fun, is it ever really a job? I don't know. <laughs> in my life, very early on, I took a, a photography class and one of the principles we talked about was all about direction of light. And the exercise that I was given was you hold your hand up like this and one side of your hand is brighter than the other side of your hand. The side of your hand that's darker, that's the shadow side, right? And so generally, with this composite here, I'm seeing that the light is coming in. Am I still on screen here? Yes. Okay. So the light is coming in from this direction. It's coming in like this and falling on our scene. Now I can also see, because the top piece of the orange juice is a little bit opaque, there's probably a little kicker light throwing some, like a very concentrated light, like a gridded uh, reflector or something that's very concentrated, throwing a little kick of light against the side of the drink, which is what's giving us the, the shadows and a little bit of accentuation on those beads of sweat coming down the glass. But very clearly, the bulk of our light, the primary light is coming from here. So when I, when I consider that, I look at it and I say, okay, this piece of orange juice glass should be casting a little bit of shadow kind of downward like this, right? Again, we want that piece of glass, th that piece of the glass to look like it's levitating above the slice of orange just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little kiss above the orange. And then this orange, again, because the light is pounding in this way, it's naturally gonna behave like a little bit of an awning. And it's really the light, the shadow is being cast this way, right? And as the orange gets closer to the ledge, the shadow kind of falls off, right? It's just like if you take anything, you start moving it out away from it, the shadow is much smaller, you know, it, the shadow is much smaller right here than it is out here because of the, 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 the amount of space between this part of the orange. Now it's just getting ridiculously uh, convoluted here. Uh, th this part of the orange is further from this part of the glass than this part of the orange is from this part of the glass. So more shadow here, less shadow here, if that makes any sense. And then the same just goes for everything. So we get a little shadow pounding this way, this way, this way. And then of course, this is gonna have a big shadow being cast this way, right? If that makes, that makes any sense at all. So that's, I mean, that's the way I'm breaking it down. And it would go the same if, you know, if the light was coming the other direction, we would adjust uh, likewise and, and so on and so forth. And it's just a matter of, you know, honestly, I learned more about light and shadow when I built icons for like iOS apps because you it was back in the day when there was a ton of what they call skeuomorphic design yep. where it's just design that's not very utilitarian and it's just there to look pretty and it serves not really any other purpose right and and you were we were doing all these like very not really photorealistic but approaching photorealistic app icons and when you're doing that you need to start to think about okay where do i need to create a highlight versus where do i need to create a shadow it's not like taking a photo. When you take a photo, the shadow's there, the highlight's there already. And a lot of times, you, I mean, you should think about it, but you don't really have to think about it. And if you haven't been doing photography for a while or you don't do it professionally or you don't light your own scenes and you don't work in a studio environment or you're not doing on-location, off-camera light work, um, 
you really aren't thinking about that kind of stuff that much. Uh, but you know, instead of buying five thousand dollars in pro photo light heads and you know a camera and everything else to go out and start learning on location, start you know make sort of like complex UI elements, photorealistic icons, things like that. That's one of the best ways to begin understanding direction of light and highlight versus shadow. At least that's very early on for me. That helped me. That helped me more than drawing did. That helped me more than like conceptual stuff about how to light scenes and photography did. It was just, it was the best. Because I could sit down in an afternoon, I would learn a little bit about it, I would kind of start to understand how it worked, and I would finish whatever tutorial I was following, and, and I would have something cool that I could be like, hey, friends, look what I made. And usually your friends don't care that much, but you know, it's you, you still feel good about it. So. Right. That's, that's all that matters. Yeah. Well, and it yeah. helps, I imagine, to learn how to read images that you're working with, too, whether you take them yourself, whether somebody else... Well, yeah, of course. Them. And, that's, and that's, an, that's another one of the merits to when you look at somebody else's work, instead of just saying, I want to copy this, it's great to want to try to copy somebody else and go for it. In trying to copy, you know, your icons, and, you know, if you find 100 pieces of artwork and you say over the next year, I'm going to copy all 100 pieces of these, these pieces of art or these photographs, number one, you're not going to be able to copy them exactly. But number two... What's going to happen in that process, maybe 10, 10 images in or 20 images in, you are going to establish your own style. And it, it, was, it was funny because as a young photographer, when I first got started, I, everybody was saying, develop your own style. You need to find out who you are. And I'm like, I, what does that mean? I don't know who it's what, a tall what? Order. Right, I don't know <laughs> what this means. What, what am I, I'm just like, I'm punching you know, a ghost at this point. I don't know what's going on. So I, what I did was I just started trying to copy images I saw other people doing. And it begins with looking at the photo and trying to break it down. All right, did they use a, a 69 inch Okta and a, you know, a small softbox behind or dual beauty dishes? Did they gel those beauty dishes? Is there a reflector kick and fill light in the front or do they have multiple strobes in front? Or, What's going on with this shot? And a lot of times you can read a lot from the eyes, the catch lights of the eyes. Um, but what happened to me was in trying to copy these, these artists, I just developed, eventually people started emailing me and saying, I saw this photo and I knew it was yours because that's your style. That's cool. Can you do photos in that style for me? And I'm like, I don't know what my style is. I just go out and take pictures and my style happens. And ev eventually what happens is you have confidence in that and you say, yeah, I can shoot photos of my style. Right. And you know that when you show up and you do your work, you, you know that when you design a logo or you build a composite or you take a picture, it's going to be this certain style because that's you. Because that's you and that's just, that's happened over the years or months and years of you uh, doing what you do. But that, I remember, that was a very frustrating thing for me early on when I started doing any kind of graphic design or photography was this whole, don't copy anybody, find out who you are. And what you end up doing is just you draw circles in the dark for a year. Like, I'm not going to draw circles in the dark for a year. I'm going to make stuff that I want people to see. The very first thing I, I, like, thing I was proud of that I completed in Photoshop a few weeks after I got Photoshop was I copied Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album cover. And I thought it was cool. I didn't follow any tutorials. I just, I discovered that if you Gaussian blur a shape like a triangle, you get this cool, like, prism effect around the edges, like a, an inner glow. I was like, oh, that's cool. How can I use this? And I was like, ooh, pink side of the, or uh, pink floor, dark side of the moon. <laughs> there we go. And I posted it and shared it, and, and I got I caught a lot of flack because people were like, oh, this this isn't that good. You just copied Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. But you learned. My, and my answer was, you're right, I did. You, yeah, and I learned something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, great. You ready to take a look at some of these infographics? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's, Let's go, go ahead and take a look. We got 11 um, submitted before the deadline. Don't worry if you're still working on it or if you just missed the deadline. Um, submit it during the next segment and it will be reviewed. Um, there's a segment after that, so all day this is going on. But let's just go ahead. I'll just bring this a little bit over here, or we can see okay. it there. Yeah. And let's take a look. It's a little more intimate. If yeah, we yeah. Share the laptop. So we got popular. Fr I think, and I when looking at these, I saw a lot of people were kind of we're on theme. They're on okay. theme. We got fruits cool. going on and I better health, it. which is amazing. So I love it. Strawberries, mango, watermelon, apples. That's cool. And I like the use of the highlight and shadow on the ribbon. Right, because without that, it just would be a weird like serpentine effect. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you add the highlight and shadow, all of a sudden you see depth. That's there's there's your faking uh, three dimensionality. Yeah, very cool. And a nice watercolor effect. Yeah. and the simple drops. I have to I have to compliment whoever did this one. You didn't try to do too much with the drop shadow. It's just a simple, clean cut, square edged, not too much blur. In fact, probably not any blur. Drop shadow, very utilitarian, very straightforward. I dig it. Nice. And cited your sources. Incredible. <laughs> exactly. Incredible. So the healthiest foods. Should we pick a favorite? It's uh, kind of I mean, hard to know. Salmon. I'd have to go with salmon. <laughs> I might have to go with dark chocolate. Well, dark chocolate's not bad. Not I'm, I'm one of these guys, I don't really like avocado. I try to force myself to eat it, but I don't like it. I don't like walnuts. Everything else on here I like. All right. 
So did you know that just one lemon has more than 100% of your daily intake of vitamin C? So I, I mean, just have a lemon, one lemon every day. You know, it's, this is nice text choice, by the way. You paired a, uh, you paired two sans serifs. I would have liked it a little more if you paired a sans serif with the serif, but it does kind of work. Um, I like um, the research that went into it. It's obvious you went and found information on all these different things. And also the color, the color coding of, of everything is on point. I yeah. like it. Yeah. I like the spacing. I maybe would have liked it if salmon was pushed over a little bit, but I can see why you have it left aligned because if there was a grid line there, it's going to line up with healthiest foods. So I kind of, um, I kind of get it. And it's, it's healthiest foods, not healthiest foods. But again, we're just, we're going through the drafting yeah, stage. So I won't hold right. it against It's a little typo. We all make them. Yeah. We well, and a nice uh, a texture applied it. You can even yeah, see that it's applied absolutely. to the text. So yeah. good illustrative technique. Good, there. good attention to detail yeah. and a, a lot of information presented, uh, Nicely, I like it. Yeah. All right. So wash your hands. All right. We get to learn what germs are. Oh yeah, yeah. This is uh, either somebody did a lot of drawing very quickly, where a lot of artwork was, was shared here. All right. Yeah, I know. Fungi, bacteria, viruses, the dirty dozen. These are twelve extremely common and dirty surfaces that you touch every day. We've got a keyboard. I have to be honest. I don't know how much I believe in the germ theory. The germ theory. I'm, ve I'm very like up and down about it, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't want to get into it. But I know frequently miss. Wow, look at this. this your is right a... thumb is more frequently, <laughs> unless one of these is the inside of the hand, and probably. Your right thumb. Oh, yeah, palm and back. All right, so we're learning a lot here, including how to wash our so hands. So the back of your thumb. Yeah, I feel like the back of your thumb, you don't really wash that much. I don't give the back, I don't show the back of my thumb that much love. All right. That's well, we true. We might have to. <laughs> cool. Well, that's nice. I mean, that's a lot of information. It's. It's a lot of information. I guess that's that's what I'm trying to say. I, I, I um, hmm. Most important piece is kind of yeah, up here at hands. the top. Wash your hands. No, that's very cool. And I, li I like the graphics for the bacterial stuff. And I actually like the, the font choice as well. That's nice. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, curious I think about I, these illustrations. I think I would have liked if like the what are germs and the text beneath it and the dirty dozen and the text beneath it. See how uto is color coded kind of to the background color? of like with the hands, mm -hmm. your hands are out. Mm -hmm. It's that yellow. It would have been nice if those two pieces of text, I'm not saying they have to be bright blue, but like even if you reduce that black to like 90% opacity, it's gonna just assume some of that background color and just, you know, thematically just blend in a little bit more. Right, keep the information a little bit more it's, te yeah. tethered. But it's to still, it. I mean, it's nice. Yeah. I mean, you put some work in it and we didn't even get to the hand washing 101 instructional at the bottom. <laughs> That's right. View the gallery to learn how to wash your hands. Yeah, it's, man, it's this there. is gonna be a tough one today. All right. All right. So this looks like maybe the same person that did the other one. Or <clears> maybe the <throat> same, started the same. with the same template, perhaps. Oh, okay, all right. So we got, yeah. right, I forgot. I keep forgetting we're working with templates here. Um, nice, okay, I mean, it's, so this one, a couple things I probably would have done differently. I would have really eased up on the heavy drop shadows. And I empathize with you so much with the drop shadows. When I got started designing, I put a gloss and a big poofy drop shadow on everything. It was my bevel and emboss. Thankfully, I learned early on to kind of steer clear bevel and emboss, except when, you, you know, when you're using it correctly. I'll put it to you that way. Um, so I probably would lay off some of the, the heavy shadows. That'll help make it look... Again, it's not about really making it look better. I mean, it will make it look better, but you also have to remember you want it to look professional. You're not, most of the time when you're when you're designing something like an infographic, you're not just making it for like you or your portfolio. You're making it for a particular purpose, a company, an organization, whatever. And you wanna be able to make something that not only looks pretty good, but it's gotta be like, if, if, if looking good is like a health bar, you also need to kind of fill the health bar for professionality as well. And when you add, the big drop shadow just doesn't, I don't know, it's just something that's so not trendy right now that it's hard to kind of sell the professional aspect of the heavy, heavy drop shadow or the heavy blurred drop shadow. Yeah, it can be used um, to good effect, but so, yeah. subtly and... Yeah, other than, the, I mean, other than the drop shadow, it's it's pretty solid. I maybe would have made the stethoscope logo a little smaller, maybe health infographic. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not bad, it's not bad. I mean, the font choices are okay. I think I would like to see it without the without the heavy drop shadows. I think that'd be interesting. Cool. And uh, but yeah, no, good job overall. Good job. You're going places. Yeah, You're going good, places. Good and it's better to be going this way than this way. Always remember that. <laughs> Always please remember that. Five reasons to run. I like. I see now. I don't usually like scripty fonts unless they're like hand done fonts, like our next guest was doing yesterday. Um, but uh, but this is actually a nice font. I like that. I like that up, up top there. 
Um, and you got the yellow and blue, which are opposite colors. So they're playing off of each other, okay? It's a little harsh, maybe, in terms of the color scheme. Um, but I like how you've got the health bars coming out of the woman that's jogging. That's very cool. Direction, um, yeah. Endurance, heart healthy, stress relief, low cost. I feel like low cost for jogging should be higher than that because all you got to do is run, right? I mean, I guess you got to get buy shoes. shoes. Yeah, and shoes can get up there in price. That's about it. That's... Yeah, some people run without shoes. And the fun, the thing about running is the fun starts out very low, but after a few months it goes up. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, lo I like the ease, I mean, the the information, we're, we're getting right to the point. Five That's, reasons to run, you see the five reasons. It's yeah, very I mean, direct and to the point. Yeah, You're right. right about Clarity that. in meaning with infographics is everything. Um, that's what it's all about. It's about visualizing complex. And nobody's going to miss, yeah. nobody's going to misread this. Right. It's also interesting, her one leg looks like she's been like having it hang out the car door because it's more tan than the other. You know, sometimes right. like yeah, this yeah. arm will get more tan because yeah. you're driving and you're... Your arms well, maybe that's what she did, <laughs> or maybe she's just been running only at sunset, you know, facing the coast. All right, so this is pretty cool. Again, another thing that I would do here, and and I can't I can't blame this on whoever the designer is. It's probably part of the template. I probably would have gotten rid of the gradients. I feel like the oh, flat, the fruit, yeah, yeah. yeah, I feel like the flat would have looked a little nicer. But again, I can't I can't hold that against you because it's I'm I'm, just, I'm sure it was part of the template. Yeah, I love the text choice, very clean. Again, pretty to the point. You know, you got to take a moment to look at it to figure out what's going on and where everything's headed. Um, percentage of fruit and, and vegetable in a healthy diet, 30%. Portions of fruit and vegetables should be eaten daily, five. Yeah, I mean, that's not bad. Overall, solid. I would say that, that's that's solid. You know, what's not solid is that only one in 10 people eat the right amount of fruit and vegetables daily. So we, I think collectively we should, There's be, a work, message. We should be working on that. <laughs> There's a message here. Right. <laughs> All right. This is interesting, the sort of uh, cyclical... Working with the sun, sunrise, I mean the sun position. Yeah, I um, it's hard. I, yeah, I think the text. As soon as the text, when you're doing text on a path, as soon as the top finishes, I think it should flip and continue the other way. Right. So you're not having to turn your head to read yeah. it or infer what you're reading. I mean, I don't think my grandmother would be one to do yoga, but if she were to come across a poster like this, I mean, she would probably be like, "Watch this! I'm not reading this." But yeah, other than that, pretty good. Um, and I guess it's the redder the piece gets, the more stressful you are, I'm assuming. Changes follow yoga sessions. Well, each of these is a, a difference in how you, your enthusiasm starts off, you know, six uh, units and then okay, ends here. Okay. I wonder if uh, maybe I, I don't actually see. I feel see. like the boost in energy level should be green, not red. Right. Because I immediately, and especially like from where I'm looking at, it looks like the guy's yelling a little bit. So it looks like he's angry. Like I immediately think red, dude screaming, anger. anger. And then I see like the energy level going up and it's like I go from being a little mad when I start yoga to a lot mad when I finish, which is true with me. I tried hot yoga once and it was my, well, my it'll, anger it'll energy your level. Temperature. Yeah, yeah. My, my anger energy level went up in kind of a very similar fashion. <laughs> Richard says, good <laughs> neck workout. So perhaps this was actually intentional that we're kind of stretching ourselves to read yeah. our stress level. Exactly. Okay, oh boy, this go. is interesting. This is the one we've been waiting for. Beer. Right. First of all, it needs to be a little bit bigger. That's my first initial. <laughs> right. Uh, reduction of the work of the brain by 20%. <laughs> Decreased cardiovascular problems 30 to 36. 6%. Is that what it says? Yeah. Reduction of stone examination in kidneys. That's a big one. Reduction. I don't want. I don't want stone examination in kidneys. That Is this if you stop drinking beer? I can't imagine <laughs> drinking more beer reduces this. I think size. it's if you. I think it's if you drink beer. <laughs> but we know there's a disclaimer at the bottom. Super this helpful. Is, this, this is not is accurate. Ask your doctor. Yeah. I'm not a doctor. It's like the surgeon. It's the graphic designer surgeon general warning disclaimer. Yeah, because if it decreases the stress level in the brain by 20, percent it's got to be. It's mm -hmm. got to be the alcohol, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The title says it all. I and bold. Also, I also still trying to figure out if these are shorts. Well, I, I was going to say, I appreciate the censorship. <laughs> the censorship. Last, <laughs> thing, last thing I need to see is the crotch of a comic man. Right. That must have been the beer making some decisions. <laughs> right, so. Exactly. All right. Exactly. We're moving on. Ooh, so, you know, this is, immediately, without even, like, conceptualizing what it is, I like this because it's flat, right? It's just simple. It's flat. It's to the point. Um, again, the structure of, of how the information is displayed, you're, you are limited because you're working with a template. Two million fruits are eaten daily. 23% of fruits are juiced out of the total. That's a lot. That much juicing going on. 24% yeah. of people only uh, eat only junk food. And two out of 10 people work out every single day. That's great. I mean, this is nice. I would, I, I, I appreciate the shout out for the Adobe Live Challenge at the bottom. I won't hold it against you, but I, I don't like it at the bottom. 
I think honestly, well, I think it would be cool at the bottom is if you take the health-related infographic logo and you make it very tiny, still white, and just center it right down there on the bottom. Yep. Maybe set the opacity to like 50% to assume some of that reddish, uh, kind of flat, bricky red color. Be cool. Yeah. The burger is making me happy. Hungry. <laughs> Are you one of the 24% people yeah, that are yeah, eating only I want food. The, I might have to go ju juice some of my vegetables. <laughs> juice, All right. Juice your burger. Then yeah. You Jogging infographic. Oh, yeah. We had to zoom in on this one. Some of the text is becoming a little illegible, so possibly exporting at a higher resolution. This looks like it's vector, so you could probably export at any size. This is nice. This is nice. I mean, it's, you know, again, pretty simple, pretty to the point. I like the color scheme bar up at the top. That's mm -hmm, cool. Mm -hmm. Simple icons, simple boxes of text. Um, a part, I, I always feel like I need to see numbers when I look at an infographic. You know what I mean? I want or like a progress bar. It may be what you right? expect is da yeah, the yeah. data to generally. Yeah, generate but again, that's you know you're working with the template, so it's it's not um, you know okay yeah. Yeah. yeah that's nice cool. And finally, oh hello, yoga and you. Ten point three billion dollars spent on yoga in two thousand twelve. That's a lot. The font is not not really what you want to go with. I'll put it to you that way. Um, and th I, th I feel like a lot of tanning salons and yoga places, there's a lot of this kind of like, like the faux scripty fonts. I don't know what it is. I don't really like it though. But what I do like, it's a great concept. I love the concept. I love the, the variable size circles. Um, the information is, I mean, you've got everything from Statistics like how much money is spent on it to the fact that it increases flexibility and lowers stress and improves coordination. That's something I could use. Uh, reduces the risk of illness. It's also, a, I feel like, a, a relatively good thing. Um, yeah, and the blur in the background, too. I don't know if that came with the template or not. That's kind of... Yeah, it's kind of... It's sort of working. The, I get the effect, sort of everything emanating from the core. That's a right. common sort of like fundamental in yoga and it's sort of represented here graphically so I think conceptually that's kind of really interesting it probably could be pushed a little bit further um, but you know the fact that all this information is coming right from the, the center of the image the, the, you're right you're right and 100% it definitely conveys that like from the center here's this energy and it's emanating outward and sort of your aura <clears throat> but what you have to you have to keep in mind especially as a graphic designer when you begin using fades of color and heavy blurring and things like that, um, especially like this where you have a color that's just going to fade to your just white background, when you have some, you really limit how a graphic this, like this could be used. Pretty much it's a web graphic, probably something that would be used on like Facebook or Instagram. Um, and, you know, in order to print it, you'd have to flatten a lot of stuff out and really simplify a lot of things. There was a really great logo designer uh, who I used to follow years ago. And one of the things that he said that still sticks to me, and it's still part of my workflow when I'm designing logos or really anything graphically, is design in one color first. And if it works in one color, once you start adding additional colors, it's going to look, you know, presumably even better. So... In this case, if you had laid it all out and just everything was black across the border, everything was like a, a, a desaturated dark blue, right, or whatever you wanted it to be, and you looked at it and you said, you know what, this layout works, the information is there, the dissemination of information is kick and tail, uh, the sizing and positioning of the graphics looking beautiful, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce some color, right, and it's going to work. And especially if you develop a color palette, use Adobe's Got Color.Adobe uh, com, which is a great color scheme yeah, tool. Yep. You can go there and pick out a simple, you know, two color scheme. You know, just pick out two colors. Keep things simple, right? Keep it simple. Stupid isn't that the saying? Or keep it stupid kiss. simple. Yeah, yeah. I forget which it yeah. is. It's, <laughs> keep it's it one of the two. Yeah, yeah. I'm the hard on myself. Principle. I'm hard on myself, so I usually say keep it simple, stupid. Cool. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So do we have to pick a winner. We get to pick our favorite right now. So all right. So, so we're starting my... here with the beer and ending right here with healthiest foods. Okay, so of. my favorite is either this one. All right. Or I like that one and also this one here. All right. So, I don't know, do you want to be the one to do you want to be the one to make the final choice? That yeah. way they can that way they can hate you for it. <laughs> no one's uh, In fact, we've seen a lot of people appreciating the frank and honest feedback, which I think is great. Well, um, I feel like I so okay, let me tell you why I do this. I one time submitted a portfolio of stuff for review where I paid for a critique of my portfolio and I got a whatever like 
I don't know, 20 minutes with the guy. And actually, I had somebody else recently just tell me they did the same thing with their photography portfolio. I submitted a graphic design portfolio for review that I paid for. And it took the guy about 10 minutes and the review is kind of like, oh, you're great, you're good to go. And I remember feeling like this, this is so disappointing. I wanted to like, tell me where I messed up. Tell me where I did something wrong. I don't want to know that everything I did is just great and good. I mean, it feels good, but it also kind of is like, I want to get better. Yeah, you want to get grow. better. Yeah. Don't you want to get better? I want you to get better. I want to get better. All right, what are we doing here? I think we're going to go with the flat one. All right, yeah, I yeah. agree. I like that one. Super I strong. It. It's clean. Yep, clean. It looks, it's high. It gets high marks for looking good and professionality. Like you could sell this graphic to a client for, you know, whatever, insert the number of dollars here that you would charge for a project like that. All right. So congratulations, uh, Chaman Sharma. You're today's uh, winner. You're going to get a one-year subscription of Creative Cloud for free. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. There he is in the chat already. So we've got like <laughs> 10 seconds left. Let's go ahead and go back cool. just to see where we ended up here. Okay. Um, and we'll be signing off. Very, very soon. Yeah. Made a really amazing composite today yeah. with Nathaniel Dodson. We're going to be back tomorrow um, creating some more composite work in Photoshop. So Tomorrow's be sure to tune fun. in. Tomorrow's Stick around for the rest of the day. We've got Shauna and Paul coming up um, and it's going to be awesome. So thanks for joining today. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye.